This is a time for humility in multi-asset investing. We're likely to see the lag effects of policy tightening and a growth slowdown. We're definitely having a reset to a higher actual return environment. This economy has a huge mosaic of factors that are inputs to what's happening in the overall market. That's what we're seeing now. Challenge in the bond market, success in the equity market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on a Monday, an historic Monday for the bond market. We will get to that in a moment. Joining us today, John Farrow on an island south. I'm really not quite sure where he is. Taking the short straw, working from the early morning hours, a gentleman from Ireland, Manus Cranny, will be with us today. This is a good and beautiful thing. Welcome to the show. Tom, good morning. Lisa, good morning. Yeah, well, Lisa, I'm doing better than the English are after the, uh, after the World Cup run. The World Cup, we'll talk yeah. about that. Australia with the late moments here. Right now, we're <laughs> going to talk about something Bramos focused on. You see it on television. You can hear it on radio, 5.01 percent on the 10-year yield. Lisa, history made this morning. First time since 2007 that you've seen uh, the 10-year yield cross that 5% threshold, and it comes at a time of risk-off feelings right now in the market. This is important. <clears throat> Usually risk-off, people go into treasuries. It is the haven bid. No longer is it the haven bid, at least for the past couple of weeks. That's significant in a time where people really don't understand why yields keep climbing. Well, this, without question, the conversation of the week, and I would have to say that we've got a lot of good thoughts on that. Mohammed al published Rishi Sharma of the Rockefeller International with a sharp uh, note in the Financial Times as well. El Arian looking at this instability in Manus, the instability here, it is global. It is global. You're seeing bond yields rise, gilts rise. So there, there is this overall momentum. And the conversations that I'm having are, we're sitting here going, why are asset managers and why are insurers not stepping in here in more size? on these rich yields. They simply do not have what's referred to as the convexity. They're not forced into buying here. They're already long and wrong. Right. And so the appetite is simply not there. Right. What you've got this morning is in part some of the hedges that right. were put on on Friday on the Hezbollah-Israel war. Lisa, should we ask him some banking questions <gasps> so he feels welcome here? Is that, is that Man is cranny welcome? holding court at Brasserie Lip in Zurich. We're going to go right there right now. Let's take your experience with UBS. How scared would you suggest, Manus, the big banks are right now with this price down yield up unraveling. This is what's going to push major banks to review their VAR. It's going to they're going to review their risk parity. They're going to pull in. They are. I mean, FCON is tightening, and so you're going to have you're going to have right. major review of risk books this morning because we're shifting into a, a, a different paradigm now. All right, we're going to we'll go to Lisa here on one more question, then we've got a little bit of geopolitics to discuss as well. How does a 5% yield redound through credit? How does it redound this morning? He's throwing the mic this morning, market? isn't he? Well, <laughs> it's, it's a good question, and it hasn't been that traumatic, at yeah. least so far. And I think that I has been the big takeaway. And Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank this morning writing, he doesn't buy it, right? And there are many people who say, how can this be that over right. 20 years we talked about the existential risk of everything getting blown up if yields ever rose? Yields rise, and so no one cares, right? And all of a sudden these things are managing just fine. At what point does that change? We're going to advance the discussion here on what we see in the eastern Mediterranean. Lisa, just a horrific weekend of waiting on war and considering a humanitarian crisis. If you take a look at oil, the headline is people are a little bit on the margins less concerned about some sort of regional protracted event. If you listen to all the Sunday talk shows, anything but, you heard uh, Tony Blinken coming out and saying, we're worried about our troops in the region, we're right. building up all of this stuff. I mean, it didn't sound like we were getting closer to resolution, but it does seem like they're holding off on a ground invasion, at least for now, possibly for hostage release. Uh, uh, Emory Horton with us as well, our Oliver Crook in Tel Aviv. There is a merger this morning at 60 billion all in with debt, total enterprise value is what we call that. And it's real simple here. Chevron, and for those of you worldwide, this is the reality. We're doing this for El Arian. Chevron buys <laughs> New York Jets <laughs> Petroleum. I mean, that's really what's going on here. This is a heritage stock for those of us in the Northeast that grew up with the Amarada Hess. We won't take time on it uh, right now, but this is a huge transaction of Chevron to buy Hess. It's the same green color as the New York Jets because Mr. Oh, Mr. Hess Sr. owned the Joe Namath New York Jets. <laughs> I really wasn't really 
connecting the There's only like 12 people explain. watching or listening or know what it is, but this is the New York Jets Petroleum <laughs> well, Company. I just, See? I just thought, I thought was he was going down the Irish sort of like Green Jersey road, but no, well, it's, it's, oh, it's part of that as well. It's <laughs> part of that as well. Not, nothing to do with the 11 million barrels of oil that they got in their hands? No, on. it's had no. nothing to do with Guyana. <laughs> <laughs> it's about New real. York Jets uh, <laughs> Petroleum. We say good morning to Dr. Uh, L. Arian. I'm going to look at what I, it's not out yet, Lisa, but the beginning of my data check is what I don't know yet, which is a 10 year real yield. Where will that set this morning? Especially given the fact uh, that we're looking at the highest real yields uh, that we've seen going back also to 2009. Do we start to see that continue as you see the absolute nominal yields continue to rise? What I'm looking at is also the risk off feel in the market, even as we get earnings from 30% of the S&P so far uh, this week. We're going to get earnings from Microsoft and Alphabet tomorrow, Meta on Wednesday, Amazon on Thursday. This has been the boondoggle behind the gains this year. I mean, you see the gains from Microsoft up 36% year to date. Yeah, Google, wow. Alphabet, 54%. Meta up 156%. Amazon, 49%. I had How no high idea. is the bar for these, uh, you know, behemoths, these fortresses? But can they run? Can they continue to run if you get to five? I mean, what's coming through on my IB at the moment from a couple of different brokers is this is going to punch out to five and a quarter, five and a half. That's where it kicks into so American is... American economy. But more importantly, that's what kicks into the growth stock. That but has got guy, to at some stage. At some stage, it's got to Lisa, affect damage to growth. He's worse than Pharaoh. I mean, Pharaoh's doing eight thousand shares and IPOs. Manis is on the phone to his broker. Well, I'm on the cross trainer on a Sunday, Tom. Is that not? He's not there. Continue with the brief, Lisa. Right. Save us. We also get talking about higher rates and when that starts to affect growth. We do get bank decisions, central bank decisions. Bank of Canada on Wednesday. The ECB on Thursday. Ah. Basically, the expectation is for nothing, and basically no additional rate hikes. But that'll be interesting because they've got a more difficult situation. Uh, Lagarde in Marrakesh was heated that they will maintain a 2% goal. She was focused and heated on message. I'm glad that you say that because can you have GDP where we have it now and get to 2% without some more restrictiveness yeah. by central banks? Yeah. We get that third quarter GDP print from the U.S. on Thursday, yeah. including personal consumption, core PCE, uh, and then on Friday, U.S. Uh, September personal spending, personal income PCE deflator. If you take a look at the Atlanta Fed GDP now, you're talking about a 5.4% expansion rate in the United States. Right. How does that pair with 2% inflation? Friday, Lisa and I were wasting away in Margaritaville. It was such a stressful week, and I think we pick it up right here on uh, Monday. We welcome all of you, and again, Anne-Marie Horton and Oliver Crook will join us in the seven o'clock uh, hour. Joining us now on the markets, your reset within this trauma, Larry Adam joins. He's chief investment officer at Raymond James. Larry, as you write this morning, trying to figure out what your year end note will be in a bath of uncertainty, what is your level of conviction? I mean, we have a lot of conviction of what's happening uh, in the markets in the sense that a lot of these numbers that you're going to see come out this week, like GDP, I think it's important to recognize that that's old data. That GDP report that comes out is going to be talking about the spending that we were all doing at the 4th of July, right? That's a long time ago. But I think if you look at what's happening now, real time, this economy is starting to slow. And I think by the time we get into the first quarter of next year, I think we do have a mild recession unfolding, which will ultimately help take those yields that we've been talking about this morning lower. Yeah, I know that, Larry, you talked about a 3.5% target for a 10-year yield. It was sort of shocking at a time when we're seeing it climb above 5%. Tom just asked, what's your conviction level? Do you have more conviction or less conviction as you see how much yields are rising? I would actually say more conviction because, as you guys mentioned earlier, I think these higher interest rates are starting to bite on this economy. Mortgage rates at 8%, credit cards at 21%, small business 10%. You know, that lagged effect is going to take effect pretty soon here. Why hasn't it happened so far? Is because we have all that cash in, you know, savings accounts. Uh, companies were flushed with cash, but a lot of that's now been evaporated, and I think that this is really going to start to slow this economy down pretty quickly. What impact does this break above? Good morning, this man is here, Larry. Good to speak to you. What, is, what impact does this have on credit? Do you think that you're going to see credit spreads blow a little bit higher on, on this move above 5% on the 10s? I do think that, that credit's not necessarily pricing in the risk that we see going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, as, as we said, as interest rates go lower, like the Treasury goes lower, I think you'll start to see those, those uh, spreads start to widen out. So particularly in high yield, I don't think that they're really pricing in the expectation of any type of recession unfolding. That's where I'm more cautious in this market. 
Larry, what are people doing? Raymond James has such a reach of invested retirement money. I'm assuming through no fault of Larry Adams, people in bonds are going to look at October statements with blood on the street. What is retail doing? No, it's a, that's a great question because I, I think one of the reasons why I think rates can, can come down in the lower end is because when we talk to retail investors, nobody's really wanted to go out longer on the curve. Well, I mean, why would you when cash rates were at 5% and the longer yield was at 4%? But now that you start to see those yields start to be pretty much similar at 5% this morning, I think you're going to start to see that appetite increase. And we've been talking about being more balanced recently. But as we move towards the Fed being done their tightening cycle, that's when you want to start to extend further out. So I think we're in that window where you can start to transition and take a little bit more duration with your bond portfolios. Larry, you were talking about how we're seeing data that shows strength, but it's backward looking. And this is something Mohamed Alarian was talking about earlier this morning. If you take a look at the earnings that we're getting, that's kind of a mixed picture, and it kind of confirms some of the strength on an ongoing basis. How much are you willing to change your view on increasing caution and chance of recession if the earnings that we get this week, a significant chunk of the S&P, shows that strength in big force? Well, I think you're right. This is an incredibly important week from an earnings perspective, where we get over 40 percent of the market cap. But I think that there's really something important, that the economy isn't necessarily the equity market, right? A lot of the companies that are coming out have been a little bit more immune, particularly in the technology space when it comes to uh, their earnings growth. But when you look at the underlying economy, when it comes to retail, when it comes to some of the banking part of the, the economy. I think that that's where you're going to probably see a little bit more weakness going forward. But this is a big week because historically, this is the week, the third week of earnings season tends to be where you start to see those earnings expectations start to move higher. If that does not happen this week, I think we're going to be challenged to get that year end rally uh, going forward. Morgan Stanley warned that perhaps the estimates for profits are a little bit too high going into this earnings season. What's the narrative that's going to be most important for you as you look at these big tech earnings and the others that come down the pike this week? What is the most important narrative? Is it about the guidance for 2024 or something more specific? No, it's absolutely about the guidance. I, I mean, I agree that, that earnings are inflated for next year. <clears throat> you know, we're looking at earnings for the most part to tread water going into next year. I mean, consensus is around 246 in earnings. We're going to be somewhere between that 220, 230 next year. So I think there is a significant amount of digesting of, of the eventual weakness in this economy that's going to have to be factored into those earnings. So clearly, <coughs> guidance will be the most important. Larry Adam, thank you so much. This is Raymond James. And of course, we wrap it around in November. November 2nd will be important. Apple earnings as well. I want to dive into the data check right now. The news flow is so extraordinary. We gave it a second shift. Pharaoh emails in. From, well, I don't know what island he's on. He emails in. He says, Tom, I got, I'm in the pool with an umbrella and my cocktail. <laughs> Would you please help me with the data? Lisa, oh, yeah. let's go there right now. Two cents spread, disinversion in place, going from pre misra negative 100 basis points. We're slamming up to negative 11 basis points. While Manus is with us this week, we could see twos and tens the same. Right, we could see a disinversion in a dramatic way. And this is bad, right? Everyone was talking about how an inverted yield curve was really bad and that indicated <laughs> recession. But it's now people saying, well, when it disinverts, that's when the real trouble starts. And here we are. I mean, that's basically what you're seeing going on dollar yen for 150 for a cup of coffee here uh what what do they drink in ireland do they have a dollar 50 for a cup of coffee are you joking me 150 yen is what we see here right now 149.98 and to both of you here you know it's expect the unexpected but i'm like how does japan respond to a five percent ten-year yield manis well, the biggest risk for Japan is this, is that they've got to tweak YCC. It's floated out in the Nikkei overnight over the past 24 hours. If they yank YCC or tweak the rates, Tom, yeah. you've got a trillion dollars worth of treasuries that they own. What happens to the flow of treasuries right. if they tweak? Exactly. The knock-on <clears> event. <throat> Brent crude under $92, not affected by what we see in the eastern Mediterranean. Well, I think people are breathing a sigh of relief that there hasn't been a ground invasion yet, but it's sort of... It's a little too soon, though, isn't it? Oh, well, yes, exactly. When I was reading some of the headlines... Yeah. Could you tell Manus this isn't the damn BBC. We have to go to commercial break. Oh, commercial. No. <laughs> You're going to be that. heckled yeah. for commercial. your Commercial. In the 7 o'clock hour, well Way Lee will join <laughs> from BlackRock. Good Monday morning.
Bloomberg's Guy Johnson and Alex Steele sit down for an exclusive interview with Virgin Atlantic CEO Shai Weiss and Delta CEO Ed Bastian. The health of airline companies, the future of business travel, and headwinds facing the industry. Tune in today at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. London time on Bloomberg Television. Context changes everything. We expect uh, that there's a likelihood of escalation, escalation by Iranian proxies directed against our forces, directed against our personnel. Uh, we are taking steps to make sure that we can effectively defend our people and respond decisively if we need to. This is not what we want, not what we're looking for. We don't want escalation. The Secretary of State Blinken there on NBC over the weekend, managing the message uh, forward. Thank you for joining us this morning. Man is cranning in for John Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom uh, Keene. Julie Norman will join us here in a moment. She is absolutely definitive. All of her academic work in considering terrorism and the geography of the Eastern Mediterranean, Dr. Norman will be with us in moments. First, though, an update from Tel Aviv. Oliver Crook, just simply for those off the watch in America, what happened over the weekend? Yeah, Tom, it's been a significant weekend this uh, weekend, a number of developments and a lot of firsts and precedents. So for one is the release of hostages, two hostages, we understand brokered by the Qataris, two American citizens released by Hamas. They said on humanitarian grounds, no one really knows what that means or why they chose these two hostages. There's some speculation on that. But then the second is about aid, is the first trucks we saw roll into Gaza from Egypt, 20 trucks on Saturday, 14 on Sunday. But again, a fraction of what is needed according to every sort of aid organization the UN says it needs to get closer to 100 trucks a day in order to make a meaningful difference. In terms of the military update, Tom, you have continued hammering of Gaza. That is the main theater of war that is still going on. But we're seeing more and more on the northern border in Lebanon. And this is going to be an increasing concern, particularly when you think about the notions of escalation. But also, we should mention, there have <clears> been <throat> some pinpoint incursions by the Israelis into Gaza. So we take this all in full on this Monday morning. Do we have a sense, Oliver, of why the ground invasion has happened yet? So we do have some sense of that. Again, I think it's difficult to say precisely, but there definitely seems to be some of the influence that is coming to bear from some of the allies of Israel. <clears throat> from the United States, particularly, there is this concern of hostages. I mean, when you think about the equation here for the Israelis, right, the outcome is clear. They want to fully dismantle Hamas, but there are all these inputs into it, whether it's the hostages, but it's also about the sort of moral imperative of reducing civilian casualties, but with that, a very practical consideration, which is getting the enduring political support of the rest of the world. We had this Arab summit as well over the weekend. I just want yeah. to read you a short quotation Please. from the uh, King of Jordan, who said, the message to the Arab world is that is hearing is loud and clear from the West. It's that Palestinian lives matter less than Israeli ones. And he says that is a very dangerous message to be putting out there. Oliver Crook, thank you so much. Of course, Jordan buttressed up against the West Bank. Oliver Crook in Tel Aviv uh, this morning. This is an immense pleasure. Julie Norman, yes, the co-director of the UCL Center in U.S. Politics. She's author of the Palestinian Prisoners Movement, Resistance and Disobedience but basically is the definitive expert on the shades of Palestine over the last 20 and indeed the years back to 1948. Professor Norman, thank you for joining us today. I want to go back 13 years to your Routledge effort on the second Palestine Intifada. The Palestine of now seems to be divided between the terrorists of Hamas and other shades of Palestine. Can you delineate those other shades this morning? Or is it a mystery? Well, Tom, I would say it's very important, I think, to differentiate Hamas and multiple other armed actors from the majority of the Palestinian people and also from other aspects of Palestinian politics. Um, the Palestinian Authority is the main political um, body in the West Bank. I would point out, however, that the Palestinian Authority is very weak. They're the main 
partner for the West, for the U.S., for Israel. There are some who are hoping that the Palestinian Authority can maybe have some future leadership in Gaza after this war. Um, but I think it will be very difficult. They have uh, very little legitimacy. Mm -hmm. They've been very weak and racked by their own corruption. So um, a lot of questions about their viability. But I would say many other very strong right. civil society actors in Palestine. If I link Israeli threats from Gaza up to West Bank and then north to Hezbollah, and I know you've written on Twitter about this over uh, the weekend, is there a linkage of communication between the three geographies or even is there a link of communication with them back to Iran? Yeah, so I would say definitely um, communication between Gaza and the West Bank. Again, these are both Palestinian territories. Hamas has membership in both places and both are pretty focused on the Palestinian cause. Um, Hezbollah is a little bit different. They obviously coordinate to some degree with Hamas, but they are a separate entity. They're based in Lebanon, mostly in South Lebanon, and most of their operations have usually been in regards to Israeli operations in Lebanon or on that border. Both Hamas and Hezbollah receive backing from Iran, but the um, Iranian influence over Hezbollah is much stronger. And I would say Iran definitely will have a say on if Hezbollah activates um, even more so than they already have to really open up a northern front. Judy, good morning. It's Manus. In Cairo over the weekend, there was a peace conference. Um, very strong words from King Abdullah, uh, really uh, chastening the West. But what I'm interested in, Israel, Hamas, the U.S. and Iran were not at that conference. Um, do you see that as a step one of progress for the Arab response, or was it pointless, as perhaps our, our, our Bobby Ghosh opinionist, opinion columnist said this morning? Yeah, so I would say we often see these kinds of summits just in regular times, and, and especially during wartime, different kinds of, of <laughs> statements and rhetoric coming out. But in reality, I would echo what Oliver said just a few moments ago, and that is, a real concern from the U.S. and I think increasingly in Israel about the um, kind of the double bind of this operation. On the one hand, Israel obviously um, wants to uh, deplete Hamas and have this you know, operation that does that. But at the same time, you're trying to thread the needle of not having such um, widespread civilian casualties that you're actually um, increasing support for Hamas and increasing resistance to Israel across the Arab world. So there's both strategic and moral considerations there that I think Arab states are very well aware of and the United States and Israel are also aware of. Julie, uh, throughout the weekend, I was reading all these reports, the U.S. saying we're beefing up security for our own troops in the Middle East. We're very concerned about increasing attacks on them. You have a lot of fiery rhetoric on all sides. It seemed like things were escalating. And then I look at the price of oil and it's going down and people are saying, actually, it's de-escalating. Which is it? Yeah, I would I can comment on the political and I would say, obviously, there's a very strong risk of escalation right now. And I think if that does actually happen in real terms, then you would see the influence on oil prices as well. Again, I follow the politics and one of the very strong concerns of the U.S. right now. And one reason that I think they're hoping Israel will continue to um, be a little bit more cautious is this real concern of escalation, not only to put deterrence measures in place, but also to make sure that uh, U.S. presence in the region is ready and uh, prepared for any any possible um, mm -hmm. actions from uh, from Iran's proxies in particular. Uh, Professor Norman, thank you so much for joining us today on her work on Palestine over the decades with the University College of uh, London. Manus Cranny, you mentioned one of my favorite people in the orbit of Bloomberg, and that is Mr. Ghosh. Mm -hmm. You had him on the five o'clock show. This, he gets up that early. Do you believe it? He, he's on Irish time. He's on Irish time. He said he gets better. What biscuits. did the respected Bobby Gush say this morning? Look, I think it's to that point over the weekend. It's very interesting how all the media that I, I, I've read and a lot of the presidents uh, watching Blinken yesterday on Meet the Press, etc. There was very little coverage of actually that meeting in Cairo. Um, and his point was, right. unless you have the U.S., unless you have Iran, which is, of course, what we're worried about, we're worried about the proxies, we're worried about escalations, then in many ways, it, not so much that it was pointless, but is you need more power right. behind that gathering before you see a significant shift. King Abdullah's right. speech, I would encourage everybody out there, if you want to understand other aspects of this, right. go and listen to King Abdullah's speech. Abdullah of Jordan, of Jordan. with his American links... Is, is extraordinary, Deerfield Academy and, and the rest. You've lived in Dubai. What is the relationship of the Persian Gulf, the UAE, Kuwait, and others to this conflict? They wanted to, this to de-escalate.
The UAE signed on to the Abrahams Accords. This is not and it's something that they want to escalate. It's in their interest to get this off the board. Manus Cranning with years of reporting from Dubai. We will continue with our coverage of Israel again and Hamas. Uh, Emery Horton with us in the seven o'clock hour as well. The 10-year yield prints of 5%. Good morning from New York. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Ramos, and Tom Keene. Mr. Farrell, on assignment. The assignment. He's got an umbrella <laughs> yeah. in his cocktail. The assignment's a really nice one. I would like to go on a similar type of assignment. Yeah, I know. You know, it's, you know it's, it's like one of those places. It's not a cruise ship. I asked him, he says, Tom, I don't do cruise ships. Can you see <laughs> Farrell on a cruise face. ship? He's made it very clear how he'd be, up with, a, he'd be up with a cap to the cruise ship. <laughs> Go to the port. Go to the start. Oh, yeah, you think so? <laughs> no, I think that he'd be hiding in his room. Please don't talk to me. A wonderful week's rest here. Pulling the short straw. Manus Cranny joins us, and this is well-timed with all of his work for Bloomberg in Dubai and as well. I'm going to do a market check right now. It is a quiet Monday, but it's also an historic Monday. The 10-year yield within the last hour. Prints of 5%. We are well through that to a 5.01 on the benchmark 10 year uh, yield. My eyes are failing me right now. I'm going to go to a 5.16% on the 30 year bond for those keeping score. The 30 year mortgage Friday settling at 8.01%. Uh, uh, SP negative 26. A VIX critically is well out over 20. We are at 22.84, up a full stick, and maybe that VIX is indicative of the tension that we see. Dollar fractionally stronger. Oil, 92 on Brent. A crude as well. An extensive under surveillance this morning. Lisa, what do you got? <laughs> well, and I will just note, to, just to follow on with the yield discussion, we are up one full percentage point on the 10-year since August. We are up 40 basis points in the past week. Just giving you a sense of the trajectory. Under surveillance this morning on the geopolitics uh, side of things, Israel holding off on a ground evasion of Gaza as diplomatic efforts continue to secure the release of more hostages. President Biden has been speaking with all of his counterparts, Canada, UK and European leaders, all trying to prevent the conflict right. from spreading. Biden pledging a, quote, continued flow of aid right. into Gaza after already what we've seen crossing from I Egypt. sat in a shopping mall in Dubai years ago with our great team that opened our Dubai office next to the Ritz-Carlton, I could say, heavy lifting. And they said, Tom, you've got to go to Beirut and understand the oddities of Lebanon. Man is cranning now on the oddities of the modern Beirut and the northern border of Israel. It's surreal, isn't it? It is very surreal. And I've just come back from Lebanon. I spent uh, 10 days there at the beginning of August. And the communication that I've had from people there is incredibly passionate. The risk to the world is that the proxy, the Iranian proxy of, of Hezbollah, fires up even more aggressively. And this turns into something, another full front that Israel does not want. Right. So passions are inflamed in, 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 in Lebanon. In Cairo this weekend, let's call it the Arab League, literally out of Lawrence of Arabia, but at Cairo this weekend, are they in support of it? Is there shades of difference between Hamas and Hezbollah? Uh, they're, they're all obviously it, it, the, the concern, they're all of concern to Israel, to the US and to the West. Uh, and to that end, Tom, it's about escalation risk. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that anybody cares about, Lisa. One of the hardest <clears throat> parts right now is extricating governments that are not Hamas or Hezbollah from the governments that are. Hezbollah actually has a significant part of the leadership in uh, in Lebanon. So this raises a question, right? Well, none of these proxies would be would be raising the. I, I don't want to use the word game. None of these proxies would be raising the vexation, perhaps with a tacit approval from Iran. That is the. That is the back story to any of these proxies. Yeah, and we're going to be catching up with Amory Hordern shortly uh, to get more on that, as well as on this. We still don't have a House Speaker. We are entering the fourth week oh, yeah. without a House Speaker. We have nine potential candidates who are on the shortlist for the vacant position among Republicans after Jim Jordan's collapse uh, as a bidder for the House Speakership yeah, last week. I and there will be another forum tonight at 6.30 p.m. Eastern with the election process set to begin tomorrow. And okay. people are sick of this. Okay. And I will just say this, Tom. Okay. Right now, okay. a survey comes out. People are like, just get on with it. 
The majority can, of Americans are like. Can I just say this. I thought British politics was was pretty tough going during You're Brexit. Correct. You, correct. you guys and girls just take me to a whole yeah. other level. It's, it's so new it's to me. Truly it's truly lost my mind. I get, bring back the sign up again on Bloomberg Radio. It's a line. It looks like Hollywood Squares. And I'm just going to say so everybody <laughs> understands. I remember stepping on the ice years ago with a bunch of thugs from Edina, Minnesota, where they really play hockey in America. The guy second in from the top, Emmer of Minnesota, he's, we need a all-American, world-class hockey player running the house. <laughs> Is that what you I mean? editorialized. Right, so there you go. Continue. Tom, you're, uh, you know, you can go in there and put your hat in the <clears throat> ring, because evidently, why not? We have already nine. Or another major deal in the oil patch, and this one I find really interesting. Chevron agreeing to buy Hess for a total enterprise value of $60 billion. It's an all-stock deal valuing Hess at $171 a share, a share. This is the second major deal in just a few weeks. This is what I found interesting. We had the Exxon one uh, just a few weeks ago announcing they would buy Pioneer. And to me, Tom, what this highlights is the need for efficiency, the need of economies of scale, and the feeling that maybe it will get done this time around, right. that there isn't going to be anyone to intercede with it. Javier Blas publishing on Twitter moments ago on this, and he goes to the geography of it and that. That is uh, Guiana, which is off of South America. We'll talk a lot about this uh, today. Just because of time, I'm not going to go further on this. There will be a definitive moment here in the 10 o'clock hour. Alex Steele, in conversation with the chief executive officer of Chevron, Mike Worth of the University of Colorado, and Hess is the son of Leon Hess, now the CEO of Amarada Hess. I love saying that. John Hess. Can I just say, join us how many well. messages have you gotten this morning about the Hess trucks? Because I've oh, already yeah. gotten, you know, a number of them talking about the Hess trucks of people's childhood. Because that there ultimately, there it is. I did not Hess, have one that is in my deprived childhood. That's actually a really nice one. When Your you deprived were, childhood. When my deprived oh, childhood. Oh, when I was in my 60s and seven, in the 1960s and 1970s. And this is Joe Namath and, you know, Amarada has football. And the basic idea is you were cool if you had that truck. Oh, yeah. And my father wanted to save a penny and a half on gas. We'd drive by the Hess gas station and be like, Dad, the truck's over there. And he'd go, he'd be, he'd be like, totally we got to save a penny and a half. I never had. Is that what you say to your son, Noy? We got to save a buck? No, I don't drive. <laughs> that was a solution. I lost my driver's license. Carl Weinberg joins us right now. He had a Hess oil truck, and he joins us for high frequency economics <laughs> today. Carl, I, I want to get a summation of everything on this global economy and the level of uncertainty. What is the character of our higher interest rates? Your high frequency economics is interest rate analysis forward. What does this new 5% yield mean? Well, to the economy, I don't think it really means very much. I, I was amused by Lisa's comment a few seconds ago. Lisa, you're excited about the rise in bond yields over the last few weeks. I wonder where you were back in 1980 and 1981 when rates were rising by one or two percentage points every Fed meeting at the short end and rates bond yields were rising at a, a percentage point a week at one period in time. All right, that was real tightening and that was the kind of tightening that punishes an economy. But moving to where we are right now, at 5%, we're only three percentage points above the inflation target. We're only a percentage point or so above current inflation. All right? This is not punitively restrictive economic policy. We don't have to be afraid of real interest rates at this level. We have to adapt to them both in financial markets and in the real economy. But at the end of the day, all right, as we adjust to higher levels of interest rates, yeah, we'll see a little bit less housing activity as people get over sticker shock on mortgages and so forth. But as long as the real economy continues to grow, we can afford interest rates at this level. So, Carl, are you saying that right now we could see uh, the U.S. avoid recession? We could end up seeing GDP come in strongly at uh, more than 4 percent in the third quarter and still maintain these interest rates and get down to 2 percent inflation? So what I'm saying, Lisa, is I'm not saying there's not going to be a recession. Inevitably, there will be a recession. What I'm saying is that the current rise that we're seeing in interest rates and yields is probably not going to be what causes it. I don't know what's going to cause it. All right. But all right, where we are right now, we've seen in the past, prior to the financial crisis, we have had real interest rates as high as or higher than they are right now. And the economy grew beautifully. Interest rates are higher right now. I would say uh, they're higher, but they're not high. I'd say we're getting back to normal levels of real interest rates. 
If you look at the period from 1987 to 2007, the 20 years prior to the global financial crisis, 10-year bond yields averaged 3.2 percentage points above current inflation during that period. So where we are right now is kid stuff compared to where we were back in that 20-year period when we did see recessions, but we also did see periods of strong economic growth. Although we do have an entire asset system uh, that has been built up over an era of zero rates, which raises a question of the vulnerabilities that have been embedded in all sorts of capital structures that are hinged on zero rate policies, suddenly having to face off with reality, as you pointed out. How concerned are you about some of the anecdotal data that people are pointing to, including Fed officials, that show a pretty rapid pace of weakening that people are expecting in the fourth quarter? Well, we are expecting a slowdown of the economy in the fourth quarter, but from a very vigorous third quarter, as one should expect, the rate of growth that we're going to print our third quarter GDP is going to be much higher than normal, much higher than we should have expected, an outlier compared to uh, normal trends. But we're forecasting continued trend economic growth around 1.6 percent with the economy at full employment as we move forward into the end of this year and the beginning of next year. And being at full employment is both a, a blessing and a gift. All right. When I was a kid economist, the goal of the economic system used to be to get a job for everybody, you know, a chicken in every pot and all of that stuff. Everybody who wants a job right now has one. That's good. And prices are returning to, to normal rates of increase after a one-time shock to the money supply. That's good. The problem that we have is if we try to push past the levels of full employment. And that could happen, say, in a war scenario where we're fighting a war on two fronts at the same time, in a scenario where we want to produce more guns and less butter. And how do you do that when you're already at full employment? And the answer is you have to have less butter to make more guns. And that means a shortage of supply of butter of consumer goods. And perhaps the next wave of price increases will come out of our wartime scenario. But, but the prices... Yeah, go Carl, let, 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 let's just pause for thought there. You, you said we were at kid stuff level in terms of rates. Um, I can only go back as far as 15% in the UK in 1989. That, that was a few years ago. But if you say we're at kid stuff now, then is the bond market not doing enough of the dirty work for the Fed? Do you think there's much more pain to come in this bond market and this rates market? Well, the, the bond market is helping the Fed slow the economy. And if that's the right thing to do, then the bond market is being helpful. I'm not so sure that we need to slow the economy in order to regain price stability. I think that the economy will go back to stable prices as we erode away this big bulge of money that was put into the economy during the pandemic, for good reason, mind you, but with consequences. Uh, but I don't think that uh, we necessarily have to have a recession in order to get price stability. I think we're headed very clearly back toward price stability now without a recession. And I think that's great, too. Again, everybody wants a job, has a job. To me, that's an A-plus for the economy. Carl Weinberg, thank you so much with high-frequency economics. And into the central bank meetings, Lisa, I mean, this is Carl, Dr. Weinberg goes to the heart of the matter is smart people like him are waiting around for labor to crack, and labor hasn't cracked. Which he says is basically that this is the story, that basically there's going to be strength and that right. rates are not going to be what cracks it. At a certain point, though, you start seeing all these companies talk about efficiencies. I think about the deal right now with Chevron and Hess. Right. How much are there going to be redundancies and the layoffs right. that eventually will ensue? Is that the next sort right. of leg to drop that people are looking at? So, you know, you know, I said to Manus, and, you know, I said, you know, I, I really ought to look at Irish real estate, which was the most significant gasp I've had in the last six months. Manus, it's a boom economy, but to America and to the United Kingdom as well. To me, it's starkly in Ireland, the haves and the have nots. And there's a whole part of the economy not participating. That has been time immemorial in, in the Republic of Ireland. But worse now? Um, no, I mean, wealth disparity is growing around the world. The Fed released a report over the week on, on Friday which talked about wealth in this country, and yeah. it has been the biggest accumulation of wealth in, in exactly. 30, in 30 years yeah. in the United States of America. Going back to Ireland, buy Northern Ireland property. That's the call, Tom. I missed the boat in Dubai. I missed it in Northern Ireland. And I'm not taking a I'm mortgage at 8% here. here. Is, is, is Bono Bono of you two? Is he He's got a few houses out, out in the beautiful okay. part of the, the, the south of the city.
It's such a value Don't add, me. having Manus Cranny with us. Oh, I, I feel like morning. apologizing to him. It's basically yeah, says, like you know. sort of listen to an accent, and then you're like, oh, he's different. Real estate in, in whatever <laughs> country you're from. <laughs> no, from. it's ridiculous. Dublin. I missed two boats. Dublin real estate is absolutely ridiculous. Where else I are you mean, looking? it's like. Oslo, you know. <laughs> Shine <laughs> Oil, so? I'm Chevron, Amrita Sen, <laughs> Energy Aspects. Stay with us. Unpack what's happening right now. You have Russia's invasion of Ukraine again. That's drifting into the second year. You have U.S.-China issues that continue. Uh, you've now got this crisis in the Middle East with the attack on Israel on uh, October 7th and the associated response. All of these are connected, and the common theme is the energy market in terms of looking at who's buying what from where and how to manage some of the domestic expectations. Who's buying what from where? Maybe it has to do with the oil mergers we're seeing. We want to inform you with guests, expert in their fields, Daniel Tannenbaum with this global anti-financial crime practice leader, Oliver Wyman, truly expert on sanctions that work in sanctions uh, that, uh, that do not. We welcome all of you. John Farrow on sabbatical. Manus Cranny has pulled the short straw and is with us. Uh, this morning we're begging for Danny Berger tomorrow to give us you know, a step up. A bit here. of glamour. Know, yeah. A bit of glamour <laughs> here, other than what we get from M. Cranny. Uh, but Lisa, you know, Good as we get, we get into this important state. conversation with oil, it is Merger Monday. Well, and the idea that you've got Chevron buying Hess after you already saw Exxon with what we saw uh, with, with the shell patch and yeah. the Pioneer. Why? Why now? Right? Is it efficiencies of scale? Is it because suddenly the U.S. is looking out and saying we got to compete <clears throat> so that we can really uh, cash in before fossil fuels are a little bit maybe more yeah. obsolete? Maybe. Let's get right to it. Your definitive brief here on this transaction: 60 billion of a total enterprise value. Amrita Sen, expert at the Micro Foundations of the Price of Oil, and also expert uh, out of the uh, of, of the geography of oil. Amrita, I was up to speed on this in a fake way, and I'm getting up to speed quickly. Guyana, 2015, Exxon finds more oil than God in the Gulf of Mexico off of South America. This is Hess, and this is a Guyana acquisition by Mr. Worth in Chevron. Explain to our audience the magnitude of the Guyana oil fields. I think it's a fantastic uh, acquisition, if you ask me, given the fact that Guyana is actually going to be uh, the most prolific non-OPEC supply growth in the coming years. Exxon, like you said, already has footprint, and as does Hess. So Chevron now, through Hess, gets exposure to that. You know, Guyana's production has been growing by two to 300,000 barrels per day. Um, it's got several new FPSOs planned in the coming years. Uh, we're talking about production uh, reaching and well, breaching a million barrels per day and continuing to grow. So it is, like I said, the most promising non-OPEC supply uh, prospect. You know, we've had Brazil take that uh, position for the last few years, and that's now flipped to Guyana. So again, in, in, in that sense, a, a fantastic acquisition. What is the distinction of Guyana? And then I believe it is too, I gotta get my map out, Manus, I'm going down in flames here. What is the distinction between Guyana and Venezuela? on the southern side of the Caribbean? I mean, of course, there's political stability for one. Uh, and the quality of oil, the quality of oil Guyana produces is actually very good quality. It's sweeter. Um, it's really liked by even European refiners who sometimes struggle to process a lot of the heavier sour <coughs> barrels. Um, Venezuelan oil is very, very heavy oil. Um, it's liked by a lot of refiners, who, like in the US Gulf Coast, that have the capacity to process that. Uh, it requires what you call cokers, uh, but not every refiner has that. So Guyana's oil is actually easier to process uh, in, in that sense. Of course, in today's day and age, though, because we have a lot of refineries around the world who need that heavy oil, the lifting of sanctions on Venezuela would actually be welcome, uh, of course, if that is to be sustained uh, and if there are free and fair elections. Surveillance, and again, there are lots of question marks around I, I'm reading surveillance correction here, Guyana, to the east of Venezuela by 600 miles between Caracas yes. and Georgetown. Thank you. Nailing that. <laughs> One of our interns just saved me on that. Not going to fly with you, are we? Well, no. no, we're done. There is a question. Why are, we seeing, why are we seeing so many of these acquisitions right now in the oil patch? 
I mean, you know, this is something our uh, team, our uh, US upstream team has been pointing out since July. We actually identified 80 companies that we thought was up for grabs. Um, I'll happily share that list with you guys. And I think of that, about 17, 18 have already happened. It, this is, if you think about the shale patch of the last decade, uh, it was fueled by zero interest rates and it was fueled by uh, focusing on not shareholder uh, growth or cash flow, but it was all about production growth. So it didn't matter whether you made money or not, just come pump and produce as much oil. That's changed now. Over the last few years, we've seen actually shareholders say, no, you actually need to return money to us, which means a lot of the acreage and a lot of the companies that had poor acreage just produced anyways, are uh, they have to get basically integrated with bigger companies who have economies of scale because that's the only way you can generate cash. So that's at the that's the main reason why we are seeing this. And then, of course, as interest rates go up, servicing a lot of these debts that they have, a lot of the companies have very, very high debts, just isn't feasible. And that's why you will continue to see consolidation. We think this is just the start and we're going to see a lot more going forward. So, Amrita, how much uh, is this also a result of maybe antitrust agents in the U.S. looking more favorably on some of these tie-ups because there is this goal to offset some of the supply fluctuations in the Middle East. I mean, look, I think that's at the margin, right? If you think about the kind of deals being done or look at the deals being done, it started uh, with Occidental uh, back, you know, not this year, but previously. It's always about getting the acreage, which is right next to yours, so that you can have economies of scale. And I think that's the underlying a reason for that. And of course, even with these acquisitions, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more production. More often than not, one plus one rigs is make, g giving us 1.2 rigs, not two, because a lot of the rigs, like I was saying earlier, is actually poor quality. So the bigger company is simply saying, we're not going to produce from here, and therefore overall production actually goes down. Exxon and Pioneer are the exception there. Every other M&A we've seen actually is leading to lowering overall guidance of the two companies rather than raising it. Amrita, good to see you this morning. Uh, does any of this deal making that you see go through reflect anticipation of a change or a material change in U.S. energy policy? We're coming, I don't know whether we're coming to the end of a Biden administration, but we're going into an election year. Policy may change. America, oil independence is key. Any of the political aspects play into the potential for deal making? I don't think so. In the sense, again, these are kind of company specific deals that we're talking about. I think the bigger challenge, of course, we have is, I mean, look, the U.S. is producing above 13 million barrels per mm -hmm. day, which is a record high um, anyways, and U.S. production continues to grow. Um, of course, the challenge I was saying is that you do have sanctions being lifted on Venezuela, even though elections haven't been held and there are still bans on the opposition candidate. That raises more questions okay. around the shale oil uh, guys and saying, why are we not being given the opportunity to produce even more? rather than you going and doing deals elsewhere. Amrita, I'll see you in a month's time in Vienna. There is an official video of, of, oh, of Amrita absolutely. and I Absolute. dancing uh, in, in OPEC during COVID, going toe to toe. See the life. Dancing. Yeah, we, that we, we are best. so sheltered. <laughs> sheltered. Li living, the li living, living the life in Vienna. Quick question on Vienna as we go to Vienna. The theory is this, uh, that the US goes to refill the SPR. Uh, over the next couple of months, give Saudi and Russia some kind of caveat to release some of the unilateral cuts. Is that pie in the sky, hopeful thinking? Uh, what is your anticipation as we go to Vienna? Do not Vienna? buy that. You don't buy that? Do not buy that. I I, don't do, I do not buy that. I think Saudi Arabia has been very clear in saying they're keeping the cuts in place because of the macroeconomic uh, concerns. Look, the U.S. has said this before as well, that, oh, we're going to buy uh, it right. when it was kind of you know, less than $80. And they didn't. They've only managed to refill 4.8 right. well, million well, barrels. And they've come out and said, oh, we'll buy the oil when it's, you know, 79. Or, I don't think they're going to get there. Uh, I'm Rita Sen. Thank you so much. And on behalf of John Farrell and Lisa, Team Surveillance really looks forward to interviewing you in Vienna here at the next cranny soiree as, as well. What, what happens in Vienna? This is where OPEC meets for seven that stays minutes. In when it's springtime in Vienna, oh, but it's going to be wintertime. Uh, no, I've never heard anyone sing on this show before. <laughs> There's a first. Um, uh, Idlevice. Okay, thank you. Uh, what seriously happens Sorry. in Vienna besides a three-day cranny junket? 
There is, well, first of all, it's not a junket to, to senior management. It's not a junket. Um, but there is a great deal of chasing around. You, you, you chase these ministers through hallways in the Kapinski. Anne-Marie Horden wreaks havoc at the Kapinski. She breaks vases. Yeah, she breaks um, But there is a, there is a lot of background and back-channeling that goes on. And indeed, right. uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what the Saudis and the Russians come with uh, in November. Mm -hmm. A number of stories today to look at and leading the way without question is a 10-year yield of 500 uh, percent. Lisa, what are we waiting for? I'm waiting for the benchmark uh, bank rate 30-year uh, pricing, and I'm waiting to get a first pricing on the Bloomberg terminal of the real yield. The there it is right now, up nine basis points, 2.53 percent on the inflation adjusted yield. You tell me how business gets done. Well, hey, you tell me how that resets some of the equity valuations. That is the highest going back to November 2008. Extraordinary. Please stay with us here. Michael McKee on the economy. Much more to come. General Frank McKenzie will join us and Wei Lee of BlackRock. Good morning. This is a time for humility in multi-asset investing. We're likely to see the lag effects of policy tightening and a growth slowdown. We're definitely having a reset to a higher actual return environment. This economy has a huge mosaic of factors that are inputs to what's happening in the overall market. That's what we're seeing now. Challenge in the bond market, success in the equity market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keene from New York on radio, on television. Many narratives on this Monday as well. One of them is John Farrell on assignment. Manus Cranny sitting in today, adding huge value, particularly off Chevron Hess with his years in Dubai and, of course, all in the Eastern Mediterranean. In this hour, Amory Horden will join us as uh, well as Oliver Crook here uh, on the Eastern Mediterranean. But we've got to go to the markets, Lisa, this morning in the Hallmark with Wei Lee coming on in moments from BlackRock, a 5%. 10 year yield. Which a lot of people thought was unimaginable just six months ago. People I was in laughed that camp. people I out of the room when they said 5%. Now you have people gaming at 6%, and people don't understand what's <clears throat> behind it at a time where there's otherwise a risk off feel in the market. Yeah. That to me is the most interesting aspect, given that it is no longer maybe the haven status that it used to be. Publishing moments ago, 2.53% on the real 10 year yield at 180, I said, Maybe it'll get to 200, and now we're out at 253. There's convexity there. There's acceleration. A lot of people said six months ago, back when everybody laughed about 5% nominal yields, that if we got to 2.5% real yields, that would torpedo all equity valuations. It would be it. Well, year over. And yet that hasn't been the case in any way, shape, or form. And that has been one of the biggest surprises. The one, well, go ahead, man. The, the question is, as you go into the dying two months of the year, do you turn into a duration hero? Do you jump in? Do you actually take bonds on here and believe that this is the top? Or does this market test out 525, 550, and look for more term premium, Tom? Well, what do you do if you're in England? John Farrell, you remember him? He was here last week. John Farrell <laughs> noticing brutal, the convexity of the 30-year guilt was more abrupt than even the U.S. The speed of a higher yield in the United Kingdom gives pause, doesn't it? Well, the risk is you saw how a bond market completely imploded in the United Kingdom Eight a year ago. ago. I understand that was trustonomics. I'm not making that kind of delusional call. But the issue is this. You've got supply. You've got many issues. Dysfunctional Washington, huge supply. You've got big issues we're, on the bond market. We're so busy now. We're going to get to the data check so uh, Lisa can give you a, a cacophony of a brief this morning <laughs> with the narratives going on. How about the VIX? Forget about 20. We're out to 22.58 with a one-stick uh, move on the VIX showing some real tension finally in the market. Futures at negative 20. In the bond market, we've been discussing 512 on the two-year yield. You can do the math on a 5% 10-year. That gets you to a 210 vanilla spread of 12 shocking basis points. This week, will we see true and complete uh, disinversion? On Brent crude, $92 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate, $87 uh, a barrel. There's a modest merger in the oil patch. We'll discuss that. Uh, dollar flat. Yen did print 150 for a cup of uh, uh, coffee, 149.96 right now. Euro back to a 106. I don't know what any of that means. Looney, 137. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Canada as well. Saving me. The Bramo brief. Well, we talked this morning, Larry Adams mentioned, uh, the economy is not the stock market. And this this week, we're getting 30% of the S&P reporting earnings, about $15 trillion of market cap. 
Microsoft, Alphabet, those tomorrow. Meta Wednesday, Amazon on Thursday. The gains of these shares have driven the entire gain on the S&P 500, led by Meta, up 156% so far this year. To me, the question is, how much do they really have a high bar to cross with forward-looking guidance? And if they miss, is that sort of going to be a significant risk factor for a market that's kind of hanging in there, but kind of breaking down on the margin? So the theory should be at five, Five, let's call it five, five and a quarter for a bandwidth on, on bonds because markets like to overreach and test, test new levels. We're in a new zone. We're above 5%. So in theory, your growth stock should, in theory, come under pressure. However, the saving grace of the names that you've just mentioned, and this is digging deep into this sort of memory of two weeks ago, is the balance sheets, the cash on those balance sheets. You're right. I think general growth will be tested, but I think some of those mega cap sevens will be resilient because of the balance sheets. Talking about balance sheets, we also have central banks reporting earnings uh, this week. I'm actually very curious about balance sheet decisions. Bank of Canada Wednesday, ECB on Thursday, not expecting a big move there. And yet we do see rates staying where they are on the two year longer term uh, in Europe for a longer period of time. And this week's economic data, to me, this is something you've been mentioning a lot, Tom, which is the GDP and how much it's reaccelerating. Yes. And third quarter GDP is going to come out on Thursday along with personal consumption and core right. PCE. And is it going to show that reacceleration that the Atlanta Fed GDP yeah. now shows at 5.4% currently? I'm so glad you brought this up, folks. This is a reframe out to what some people are saying is 5% real GDP, which I'm going to round out to 8% nominal GDP. It may be a little lighter than that, but these are stunning numbers for the pundits looking back six months. And this is the reason why some people are wondering, is this growth incompatible with getting down to 2% inflation? And is this growth really what's behind yields on the 10-year at 5%, Tom? Right now, we're going to begin here. Manis Cranny, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keene with our definitive call of the day on global fixed income. Wei Li is global chief investment strategist at BlackRock, prodigious in mathematics, and joins us here on our fears of price down and yield up. Wei Li, thank you so much for finding the time. Where is the bid on bonds? To me, the bid is walked away. Is that true? Is there just a dearth of bid across all of fixed income? There are lots of moving parts right now. Good morning, um, everyone. Um, in terms of our view on long bonds, long duration, we have been underweight U.S. long duration for three years now, since late 2020, when 10-year yields was below 1%. And last week, we closed the underweight to get to neutral. There are a couple of moving parts in terms of why rates have repriced so very meaningfully. The first piece is policy path repricing. And the second piece is term premium repricing. And within that, inflation premium is part of premium. So where we are now with 10-year yields testing 5%, in our assessment, policy path is not that different from where we think it should be. But term premium, depending on which measure you use, we're looking at somewhere between 20 basis point, 40 basis point, uh, different methodology, actually could push even higher over the strategic horizon. So we're talking about term premium over the strategic horizon at 100 basis point, not out of this world because of fiscal imbalance, because of insurance dynamics, because of higher rate environment, uh, rate volatility, as well as because of higher inflationary uh, environment. So when you bring all of that together, strategically we're still underweight, but tactically we're now neutral because risks have now become more balanced. And when we think about kind of the read across of rate repricing to risk assets, actually policy path repricing can be negative for equities because it impacts the discount rates directly. But term premium repricing doesn't have to be negative for equities because it's more uh, an assessment of the relative appeal of duration in portfolios. Do you think, Wei, I know that you've been leaning into the whole AI discussion and the whole AI thesis, and that's been driving some of your equity bets. Do you think that that area is completely immune to term premia and these discussions of yields, given the cash cows that they've become? 
Well, what has been very interesting with regards to this mega tech and AI theme is that on the one hand, they benefit from the growth upgrades, earnings upgrades that we're seeing coming through. So, for example, next year, 10 percent EPS forecast for S&P 500. Half of that is driven by mega tech names, right? Five percent is coming from the tech names. So they're definitely benefiting from earnings upgrades, which we uh, pay a lot of attention to. But at the same time, they are more long duration compared with the broader equity market. So when the uh, rate reprices, it pressures down on long duration a little bit more everything else being equal. But when you bring the two factors together, actually the, the, the growth prospect and the AI theme gathering momentum and the earnings upgrades actually trump the duration sensitivity as we have seen so far earlier in the year, but also in recent periods of re repricing, actually the AI theme, the Nasdaq have been holding up better than you would have expected given the rate volatility. Well, good morning. I mean, just to carry on from that, this week they're going to see $16 trillion worth of equity reports and the magnificent part of the Magnificent Seven of tech are going to be in there. What Tom, Lisa and myself, uh, what we're talking about was the balance sheets, the cash on the balance sheets, the cash on Apple's balance sheet, the cash on the other big tech. Is that another defensive hallmark and a reason to endure and stay long big tech? That is why we are still uh, overweight, the big tech and the AI theme, because when we think about kind of quality characteristics as growth slows down, reacts to the uh, tightening environment that we're all experiencing, actually having cash on your balance sheet and not being as geared up in this environment is a definite uh, is a definite plus and more broadly we're talking about kind of uh, the impression of the earning season that the feeling is that it's holding up better but actually not forget the broader backdrop which is the earnings mm -hmm. actually the three quarters have been stagnating and we're just talking about incremental rebound from the stagnating right. backdrop so that's the big picture here Waylee lawrence from new york emails in and says ask Waylee." If an institutional firm marks to market and everything else is on the balance sheet and the rationalization is I can own it forever and I'll get paid back eventually, baloney. How do you do the math on the midpoint of where the stuff you hold on the balance sheet gets a valuation? If I've got eight years of maturity, how close is it to where you get a tipping point where you've got to confront what's on the balance sheet? Well, first, say hello to uh, Lawrence. And second, <laughs> uh, yes, indeed, we have uh, we we have to see um, more repricing um, of risk assets reflecting the higher rate environment. We look at duration, well, kind of almost there, which is why tactically we turned neutral. But if you look at equities. Um, it has yet to reflect the higher rate environment uh, by our very simple kind of arithmetic, uh, kind of very simple back of the envelope uh, analysis, you know, like uh, further 5% to 10% adjustment is not, you know, un mm -hmm. unthinkable. And then you think about private markets, there is also further repricing to to go, which is why um, greater dispersion, greater selectivity is really warranted as we think about Kind of deploying your risk budget in this environment because uh, uh, um, there is a, a different rate sensitivity across risk spectrum, which is why we're very selective uh, when it comes to right. equities. We're focusing on uh, sector yeah. style growing uh, earnings, but also very selective in terms of the private market. We like private uh, credit, we like infrastructure debt, uh, all these uh, parts of private markets that benefit right. from speculative tailwinds. I don't hear full faith in credit there. Wei Li, thank you so much of BlackRock. On this Monday morning, markets on the move in South futures, negative 23, uh, down half of a percent. You know, as Whaley was talking, she was uh, focusing on outside of the megatech and what might happen to them and the additional repricing that might be required. Uh, in response to yields. I don't think we're talking enough about regional banks. They're almost back down to where they were during the March sell-off. I mean, this to me, really, I was highlighting this uh, last week, the KBX index is down dramatically. It's less than 10% away from the low that we saw back in March. And Manus, I mean, to that point, are we starting to see the signs of something deeper starting that is sort of masked by some of the big tech. And I, I mean, I keep thinking about this as we head into earnings season. Well, we're obsessed, aren't we? We are obsessed about bonds. We're obsessed about bond yields. We're obsessed about inflation data. And sometimes the flow of money is when we take our eye off the ball. And the risk is, of course, that 
we do see an additional move of cash out of those banks. Maybe that, maybe that, is, well, where, maybe that is where the next crack does come to bear on the market. But, but the consumer is fine. The consumer is grand. So where is the next inflection point? I think part of the consumer is grand. I really don't, you know, I know retail sales were a bang up statistic in jobs, but I, when someone says the, the American consumer is grand, I'm looking at delinquencies on some loans. I'm going, eh. Well, the delinquencies on the autos, Maybe, on the subprime you know, autos is, is ratcheting I mean, higher, yeah, to be fair. The Bentley's paid for it. Let's continue here. Futures negative 21, <laughs> Dow futures negative one. John from an island with an umbrella in his uh, Bloody Mary says, quote the Dow, 33,000 on the Dow. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs>
flurry of diplomacy in and out of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I'm sure Oliver can speak to this. Today, you have Greece's Misotakis going. Tomorrow, you have Emmanuel Macron. There's a CODEL right now. There's a number of senators that are there. They are keeping up this constant diplomacy, and yeah. potentially that helps push uh, push a ground invasion further down the timeline. And Ali, to that point, there's a question of how to understand then the bombing of Aleppo's airports and how to uh, understand some of the strikes on certain Hezbollah targets in terms of trying to prevent escalation at this point. Completely. But again, what the IDF will say is that there are continued rocket fires and skirmishes in the north. And so, of course, now the Israelis have continued to bomb. And you see it more and more. I mean, you, we have uh, alerts from the IDF that say a lot of what they have done overnight. And more and more, you're seeing, yes, Gaza, but you see more and more Hezbollah targets in the north of Lebanon. And of course, that follows also the evacuation of tens of thousands of Israeli um, civilians that live there up in the border. I mean, just having been living in the hotel where I've been for the last two weeks, at first, I met a number of people there who were evacuated from the south. Now, speaking to the management of the hotel and the people there, it's people that are being evacuated from the north. So even here, some, you know, 80 miles from the Lebanese border, you're seeing the impacts. And Marie, from your vantage point, how much support does Iran have from some of the regional players versus their isolation at this moment? I mean, Iran is incredibly isolated in the Gulf when you look at the big regional players like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Remember, for Riyadh for Abu Dhabi proxy groups in the Gulf, Iranian-backed proxy groups in the Gulf that start trouble um, is not new. Uh, the Houthis, th there's a tremendous amount of skirmishes and missiles that have flied over Jeddah and Dammam from the Houthis, as well as in early 2022, um, a fire in the airport in the United Arab Emirates because of these Houthi missiles. Um, this is why there is so much concern in the region, because it's not just their concern about Hamas. It's Lebanese Hezbollah in the north, and it's the Houthis as well, which last week we did see a U.S. destroyer uh, intercept missiles coming from Houthis in Yemen, and the Pentagon said likely that was headed towards Israel. Well, the U.S. Amri, obviously, over the weekend has upped the, the, the defense. Uh, there's another war carrier uh, going to the eastern Mediterranean, and some troops have been put on alert specifically uh, on that risk of escalation number of, on a number of fronts. Oliver, let's bring it uh, back to you. The ground assault did not happen, as many had thought, over the weekend. What has structurally changed about the, the, the landscape for war of Israel on Gaza? Well, two, yeah, well, two things have changed structurally, which were two precedents were set, which is one, hostages were released, and two, aid was allowed to flow in. And we're hearing again from, uh, this is from Egyptian media. Again, it's very difficult to get a read on what's going on in Rafah. But we understand, according to Egyptian media, that you have additional trucks that are now flowing right now today into Gaza to give some of that aid through. So again, this is seen as the beginning of something important. But again, both from the hostage side is not going to be, two is not going to be enough for the Israelis and for the Americans. And aid, it's the same thing. A hundred trucks a day is what the UN is calling for. And again, when we're talking about all the pressure points and, and modes of escalation, we hear from the um, Arab community over the weekend from that summit, Manus, that you were closely following, the King of Jordan saying that the message that they're hearing from the West is that the Palestinian lives do not matter as much as Israeli lives. These are all the things that are going to go into this very combustible situation. And I should also mention that just a couple hours ago, the IDF is screening huge volumes of footage that they pulled off of Hamas uh, body cams that they're showing to journalists, which is going to be released. Mm -hmm. And again, this is all part of the temperature uh, conversation and the reaction conversation. Oliver Crook out in front of the story in Tel Aviv. Emery uh, Horton, thank you so much in Washington. Balance of power tonight will consider uh, the issues of the eastern uh, Mediterranean. We consider adjustment in the market, 30-year bond, 5.15 percent, the history of a five-year yield back to 2000. 2007 and maybe back to 1992, Torsten Slack at Apollo on the reality. We mentioned the real yield before 2.52%. Torsten Slack and NFIB Lisa seeing 10% short term loans. 10% yeah, raise for small businesses. And yeah. that's the key here. And what we've been talking about is maybe the legacy of this moment is going to be the divergence between the big and small. Maybe that's the reason why we're seeing all of the acquisitions at this point. We're going to see what some people might call theoretically a zombie roll up. You know, we might well, see something like they might that. Call it that. Somebody she might, you know. She steals from me, man. She well. steals from me. Like, it's just like, it's <laughs> a you <laughs> think, you think Pharaoh, she Pharaoh never he steals. Like that. No, he's I'm a giver. He's, 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 he's more giving, and she just, it's theft. On, <laughs> 
on the, po- theft. <laughs> on the point, on the point of deals, if you've got theft. an equity that's bid up and a powerful balance sheet, that equips you to do deals much more aggressively than have to borrow oh, in leverage come markets. On, come on, you can't equate small business America up to many more employees than we perceive with big business like Chevron and Hess. I mean, it's you're just but uncomparable. It, just take it down to the bottom level. I've arrived. I've arrived in a new country. Am I going to take a mortgage at 8%? Am I, am I actually going to go out there and borrow money at 8%? That's me. Well, that's yeah, the reason that's why people New- say that the mortgage market's broken. He's in New York City. Does he understand that? You don't buy. You don't you buy. Can't buy. You can't buy. It's either all cash. you got to have all cash like fair. It's a bit like Dubai. Yes. <laughs> all cash. <laughs> you need to have hey, relatives. We're going to quote him on that. We're going to banner up for radio on that <laughs> cranny saying New York City, a all bit cash. like Dubai. <laughs> Please stay with us on a Monday. Many different narratives, including Bond's Thomas DeSaurus. Next, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrell on assignment with an umbrella and a cocktail. <laughs> Hope he's doing well this week. Manus Cranny in... For six of the next five days, we're thrilled that he could uh, stop by here. Of course, expanding large on the 5 a.m. show. Don't forget the Manus Canny, Cranny uh, Danny Berger Rapport. You'll see that at 5 a.m. here across the Atlantic, getting you started on the day uh, in America. We're going to get you started with a data check here very quickly. Futures negative 21. The VIX is, to me, a headline item today, underreported, 22 level on the VIX. You can almost round that up to 23. And, you know, it's not 30. It's not the angst of 30 or, dare I say, 40, but quickly from an 18, 19 out to 22. Yields we'll get to in a moment. Tom Satoris with us. That uh, was Strategus. We're looking at 4.99%. We had 5%. On a 10-year, and Lisa, dollar weaker. Yen, I guess nobody wants to talk to me about the yen today. They say it's a non-story, so I'll go to $92 Brent crude as you are under surveillance. Yeah, and by the way, we will get to the end because I thought it was actually kind of interesting well, as well. Uh, we are very focused on the Middle East and what's going on there. President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pledging to continue the flow of aid into Gaza while securing the release of hostages held by Hamas. The two leaders speaking on the phone yesterday, this according to the White House, and on Friday, an American mother and daughter were released by Hamas and an anticipated ground invasion by Israel into Gaza has been delayed. And Tom, I I was really struck over the weekend, Israel saying 222 hostages are still staying with yeah. Hamas. And to me, how much does that color the entire conversation about how this proceeds? And not only colors the conversation, but if Qatar's had success in getting the released at the margin, when are the next releases? And that's a huge mystery on a Monday afternoon. And what do the negotiations look like? What are the points of leverage? Meanwhile, Chinese authorities starting an investigation into Foxconn technology, a major supplier of Apple's iPhones and one of the largest employers in China. State media saying that regulators are conducting tax audits and reviewing land use by Foxconn. Authorities also arresting an executive and two former uh, employees of WPP, which is that big advertising company. All of this making international businesses highly uncertain about doing business in China and uneasy. And I just wonder how much you start to see in some of the earnings that we get, the tech earnings, a pullback on the margins from China. It's going to be interesting to see what Apple says about demand in China. We know it's, it, it's not been phenomenal. I think the interesting thing, this, this is just simply very much a slap, which is to remind you wealth management was deconstructed. The housing industry was, was, was ripped apart. Tech was ripped apart. This is to remind you that nothing has changed in China, that when that moment changes at the very, very top level to shift, it shifts literally in the click of a finger. Did either of you see? Are you trying to snap I, I as well as he did? I mean, he's gifted. Yeah, he is gifted. Wow, we that was a really again. good snap. We won't sing again. <laughs> yeah, it's, just a a, it's, it's a reminder. It's a reminder. You know, buyer beware. You want to do business? You know, are you going to onshore, friendshore, or stay where you are? Did you see the John Stewart pulled out of this Apple production over the weekend? Brief because I, I he basically was saying he wanted to come out and talk about China in a certain way. And he was told he shouldn't do uh, that. And so he stopped his production entirely, which just sort of gives you a sense of the controversy. Meanwhile, this one's for you, Tom. Speculation around the Bank of Japan making some kind of policy move this month, growing 
as the yen tests 150 uh, against the dollar. We crossed that line yet again. Everyone's saying, ah, intervention, a report by Nikkei Business Daily. Fueling speculation, the central bank will tweak its yield curve control at its board right. meeting ending in October 31st. And I take your point, Tom. This has significance, and it has significance not just for the yen, but also for yields. It triangulates away to euro yen as well. Take out the dollar, and I've got that at a 159.05, and I haven't done the technical work of where strong euro weak yen upsets the apple cart, but 57, 158, 159 shows me the tensions that's there, and it will be in flows from Japan, not an interest rate analysis. Exactly. We, and right. the flows from Japan. Okay that, no, but that's that's exactly I read Rudy it. Dornbush. <laughs> How much are these flows really what's going to drive the yeah. next leg higher in yields? What is yeah. behind it? We don't even know at a time when yields are the highest in the U.S. going back right. to 2007. On a Monday, we're going to pause, and this is a conversation I had over the weekend with, okay, all this bow tie babble that we're doing. Is Cranny going to wear a bow tie tomorrow? There's, you know, there's no there's negative no. chance. No. No. He'll no. sing with you, but he's not wearing a bow tie. Tomorrow. No. Satorial well, elegance is all yours. Thank you. <laughs> but what we know for certain is the impact on America. Tom Satoris is with Strategus. It's a Baird company. He's had a fixed income, but he's got to bounce off the great Jason Trenert as well. And you floored me with an analysis that 70% of America are voters that are small business and they're in the churn and they only make up 5% of the GDP. Has the Fed left them behind in this yield environment? Well, I would very much say so. The Fed, by overly relying on the Fed funds rate to tighten, has put so much of that pain on Main Street USA. It's almost as if we've decided there's too big to fail. The, earlier this year, we decided their medium is too big to fail, medium-sized businesses, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, depositors there. So if that means that if there's large companies are too big to fail, medium-sized companies are too big to fail, the only place you can actually tighten in the U.S. economy these days is small businesses and households. And the Fed has done exactly that by overly relying on the Fed funds rate. With that said, Balance sheet reduction is catching up with the bond market now, and we're seeing Treasury yields rise in the belly of the curve. Okay, and we'll get there in one sec, which is the technical underpinnings of why we're seeing a sell-off. But to stick on the point that Tom was talking about, if you have such a swath of the voter base that is feeling this kind of pain, and if you have small businesses that account for a significant proportion of the jobs losing momentum, when does that start to trickle into a higher unemployment rate? When does it start to reinforce and then actually bring rates down because of slower growth? Well, we were already at that point in March of this year. We were 48 hours from a recession, which would have been very deep. And then we had financial stabilization via liquidity injections. So when does it begin to bite again? Probably sometime between Christmas and we'll say Valentine's Day when the consumer gets those those uh, you know, late uh, 2023 credit card bills in January and you start to see a pullback. I don't see any sort of slowdown in consumption. We didn't see it in the data last week. So that suggests to us the labor market's gonna continue to remain strong at least until the end of the year. But at some point in time, those higher interest rates are going to bite all corners of the economy, not just small businesses and households. Are yields rising right now because of the perception of strength that is given by some of the bigger businesses that are much stronger? I don't think so. I think yields are rising because we're finally seeing supply come in and really scare those bond vigilantes. The bond vigilantes are back and they're pushing the term premium up on all treasuries, not just the front end of the curve now. Well, they've been unleashed not just in the U.S. Treasury market, but also in U.K. gilts and on boons. What goes through my mind is that when you trigger through 5% and you see the curve moving so aggressively, do you think that we hit some kind of a point of where risk parity trades begin to get smacked or where VAR limits at various, various trading houses get triggered? Do you think that we're going to go into that next evolution of where we see a real liquidation moment? That's a tough question because I think we've seen now this is really the third substantial rise in 10 year Treasury yields yes. we've seen over the last three years. Each time you've probably seen those VAR strategies take a turn of leverage off along the way. Mm -hmm. So the sensitivity today to a 5% is probably less than it was to a 3% two years ago because they've taken from what we can see there's been some leverage that's come off. With that said, there's always another break point. I don't know if it's 502 or 517, or we might have already hit it at 490. But there's a break point here where you're going to see another round of leverage come off. 
And that's part of the reason why we're, it's probably a multi-step process, but that's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing the S&P off again as well, and credit spreads inching higher, because I think we're getting close to that point again. So who steps in here? This is the debate that we, the three of us have had for the past two hours, which is duration heroes aren't to be seen yet. Yep. You're trading above 5%. Insurance companies have a different accounting system. They don't need to come in and, and hedge themselves. Who steps into this bond market? To cap yields. Well, there's, that's a there's a good and a bad to this. The good is there's an enormous. Give me the good. The, the good is there's an enormous amount of plain vanilla core fixed income strategies that will just love to keep buying and buying and buying treasuries. The bad news is those are price sensitive investors. They're not like yeah. the leveraged investors sure. of the past. So they're going to basically come in after there's a concession. So treasury supply comes in, mm -hmm. yields tick a little higher. They come in and buy on the cheap. They're not going to be price insensitive who will buy on any yeah. dip. You are a grizzled veteran of this. I'm going to give you two ideas. One that we talked to Wei Li about at BlackRock, which is the bid walks away. All of a sudden on price, folks, not yield, price of bonds, the bid walks away, and the great Chris Whalen calls this the Whalen silence. You're out there, you're on your phone. This is the old days, man. As you had buy tickets here, sell tickets here. You're on your phone and you're going, I got a gazillion dollars of the Trenner, you know what? And there's just silence. Nobody wants that piece of paper. Are we close to that? Well, some would say we've actually hit that. People, there was a lot of fear about 30-year auction. There's a lot of fear about auctions on the front end of the curve over the last few weeks saying, there's, there were even well, what headlines. What about deaths? Norway calls up and they go, I got to sell a zillion years of that cranny of 2042. Is there somebody there to buy this garbage? There, there is, but you're going to have to put in a price concession. Uh, that is, yields are going to have to uh, push higher than what the market is trading at. And the Treasury is now no longer immune to this. I said price concession and the Bramo cam shook. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, like what point? that's the reality. Just real quick here, Tom, mm -hmm. to sum it all together, are you getting compensated for the uncertainty right now? Are you buying duration? Uh, yes, we would be. I think you're being fairly compensated. Our own measure of the term premium on the 10-year Treasury is above 100 basis points. That's a very important level, not just symbolically, but what it's telling you is that you're getting right. a normalized uh, cushion for that uncertainty. This is where yeah. you normally would be. So we feel you're being compensated. doesn't mean we can't see yields tick right. higher here, mm. but you're being compensated for the risk going forward, I believe, at this point Jason in time. Jason from a cigar bar in the east side emails in and says, talk about me. Okay, let's talk about Jason Trenner. How does this fold in? <laughs> How does your fixed income analysis fold into Jason Trenner's call in this, on the equity markets? Well, it makes us that much more bearish on the economy because we continue to see another source of stress for the consumer and now right. businesses picking up here. So what we're doing is we've delayed recession and we've said we're going to avoid recession at all costs in 2023. But that itself, there's cost to that. And the cost is going to be that the breaking point is going to be when yields are higher, which means there's more risk of financial credit events. And are you predicting that? Nothing that we can see right now, but by the nature of those types of events, there are places there you, you can't see them. So, you can't see that. so at a 5% 10 year treasury, yeah. it's much more likely than it was when we were at 350. Right. So, where it is lurking, that leveraged investor who is, is right. caught off guard, we don't know. We don't see that happening at this moment, but it's on, on our horizon. Bottle it. Tom Sosaurus there of Strategus there in fixed income, the effect across all of the American uh, economy as well. The yields here, the 210 spread, 13 basis points. I told Tom he can't leave the uh, set until we get to disinversion. We're not there yet. Maybe it'll happen in the next hour. 10-year real yield, 2.51%. Uh, Buster's right out to highs. Futures at negative 17, that would be a negative four-tenths of a percent. Everyone's been waiting for something to break, Tom. That's basically been the story, is that everyone's just yeah. saying, you know, this feels too quick, too much, too quickly, and something's got to break. And, you know, arguably in March it did. The Fed came in. Right. Why haven't things broken yet? Because of buybacks. And here's one. To get, there's a great <laughs> article. Robert Schiffman of Bloomberg Intelligence. <laughs> that was is a just, pivot. Is just, Robert Schiffman's a jewel. He goes through the buyback process of big tech with all their cash flow. Man, is cranny. Channeling Alex Steele, Chevron buyback to increase 20 billion a year after buying the New York Jets Petroleum Company. There you go. But if this is the incentive to the shareholders to get it across the line. I mean, buybacks have been for time immemorial the reason why we justify uh, there is no alternative, the reason why you want to be long stocks. It's buybacks anonymous, isn't it? It is. Buybacks are there, and we'll see a lot of that into the earnings season, and of course, through November 2nd. And Apple Although I as will well. say, if that's the go case. Ahead, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> Why are Chevron shares lower by almost 3%? Well, well true, free yeah. cash flow, what is it? Free cash flow is going to double. They're going to do a monster buyback. Who knows? <laughs> Thank I you, Venice, for that merger. He's, he's <laughs> brilliant on the sell side. He goes into fidelity and he says that. And they're like, oh my God. I just wish sometimes some yeah. analysts would yes. say, actually, we're unsure of the particular reason, you know, just tell the truth. On a typical merger, the acquirer pops down a little bit until they color out what synergies are. It'll be right. interesting. I don't know how you have synergies in a growth petroleum drilling item like Guiana, which is east of Venezuela. Do you know the way to Guiana now? Yeah, very good. It's a Bob Hope movie from 1946. Coming up here later this morning, Alex Steele in conversation on Chevron, on Hess, with Worth in Hess. Look for that. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. I think it's a fantastic uh, acquisition, if you ask me, given the fact that Guyana is actually going to be uh, the most prolific non-OPEC supply growth in the coming years. Exxon, like you said, already has footprint, and as does Hess. So Chevron now, through Hess, gets exposure to that. You know, Guyana's production has been growing by two to 300,000 barrels per day. And we're to send brilliant this morning as we get up to speed on what Chevron is doing. You know Chevron, one of our giant oil companies, and they have acquired a company foundational to New York City, to Manhattan, into all of the Northeast. I know it is Emirata Hess. It is, of course, Hess. And in conversation this morning with Worth of Chevron, a known commodity, Alex Steele joins us now on Leon Hess's son, John Hess. Why did he affect the $60 billion transaction? I don't know, and I'm going to actually ask him that later on today. And I say I don't know because you can usually see an acquiree yeah. needing or wanting to do it for different reasons. Um, and I'm not sure that we have that total answer yet for John Hess. Okay, this is really, really important, folks. And, and I think with the way you're wired in, uh, uh, guys, Alex Steele, just so you know, is the only one who's actually been to Cushing, Oklahoma. The rest of us talk about it like we know it. She knows the zip codes, the diners, the whole thing. Were you surprised? <laughs> I don't I mean, actually I mean, know the Exxon zip code for Cushing, Pioneer but, yes. was like, okay, yeah, no, the, I get it. The street was quite surprised on this. Um, also because where you see and think we're going to see consolidation is the Permian. So no one was kind of looking out for what the Guyana M&A was going to bring. Permian's Texas over to Thanks. New Mexico. I, there I've been there saying. multiple <laughs> times and maybe know the zip codes and the diners, but Motel Cushing six different story. Midland. No, are you kidding? <laughs> Midland's hot right now. There's, There's no a question, though that people were thinking of this in the shale patch. They weren't thinking right. necessarily outside, but Amrita said, said this is just the beginning because now it's about profitability, not just exploration. And so how much is this sort of the tip of an iceberg that you see percolating much more quickly? Huge. Okay, so how big is this? Because you know what it actually is about? It's about capital discipline, which I know is weird to say when you have a $60 billion deal, but it's capital discipline because that's cheaper than pouring billions and billions and billions over decades into a brownfield or greenfield exploration. So how much are we looking at a situation where there's going to be less exploration, less drilling, yeah. and much more just consolidation and efficiencies of scale? That's going to be it because of the energy transition. Like if, if you were Chevron, are you, going to spend, are, you, are you going to build another Gorgon in Australia that could have cost overruns, that could take decades to actually get up and running? No, you're not going to do that when the energy transition is happening. You're going to go pay $60 billion yeah. for Hess and exposure to Guyana. I mean, this is so important. It goes back to the London desk of Sanford Bernstein, Ben Dell and that crew years ago, where they just said, you can't dig anymore. You just got to go out and buy the existing thing, which here is Guyana. Well, it's 11 million barrels. That's what they're getting their hands on. So I, I think I think Alex's point that she makes is, is incredibly important. If you're going to be able to instantly turn on the tap for your system of another 11 million barrels, what caught my eye is mm -hmm. the transaction itself. And this is where I'm curious: is that it's an all stock transaction? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, that in of itself is significant, isn't it? 
Yeah, and the funny thing is, is that I talked to Mike about this for years, is that the street has been after him to do a transformative deal. Um, and he wasn't doing it. He was sticking very clean to like, I'm going to buy small deals. I'm not interested. I'm only going to do it when it makes a lot of sense. They've been waiting for this to happen because of their stock price. And then it happens and then the stock is kind of down. So tell me, them, <laughs> I mean, to, Tom asked me a difficult question earlier. Not that he doesn't ask difficult questions, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, why is the stock a little bit lower? Um, I said, who knows? He wasn't happy with that. But he's a nice to share buyback, which is the sweetener as well, mm -hmm. which is $20 billion. So he's, he's using all his tickets in terms of his using yeah. stock, and he's announcing a, a big buyback. So what, what does this tell you about how he's gonna frame the deal to the street? Well, also, I mean, the stock's done pretty well. I mean, in Tom's comparison- Tom's upset that it was down this morning, I, so- yeah. I, I understand, but I mean, like, but the stock has outperformed Exxon and Chevron, it outperformed their European guys also, uh, for the reasons that we well know. So I feel in terms of the energy transition, investing in solar and wind, et cetera. So, I mean, to that so, extent, so you can sensitive. sort of make the point that, okay, maybe the stock is going to get dinged uh, a little bit, but the call is ongoing right now. So uh, the questions are underway. So we'll have more of a clarity on like what the street is looking at it for and sort of how they're skeptical or not. Yes, Tom, were you going to say something? No, no, please, Lisa, jump, <laughs> well, jump in Alex, here. I gotta, you know. there, there is this question at this moment, what's next, right? If it wasn't just the Permian Basin, if it wasn't just shale, what are you looking to in terms of the types of transactions that we can expect and how big they're likely I mean, to be? I mean, after Exxon and Chevron, like, I don't know who's going to be left. Like, Manus, maybe we're looking at a BP or a Total, but like BP is a mess. I think in BP terms have of got CEOs, their own so internal their own issues. Problems. Yeah. Shell's trying to pivot more to oil and gas. Do they go back into the Permian? Like, they just got out. That feels confusing. So I don't know who else is going to be there to buy a transformative deal. Conoco is already doing their bolt on. So I don't know if it's going to be another transformative mega deal. How much is there pressure from oil? OPEC plus to not do some of this? Or how much is that the pressure that's forcing some of these deals to become as efficient as Saudi Arabia, which is incredibly efficient? I mean, you could argue like the U.S. is already producing over 13 million barrels of oil a day. So they already produce more than Saudi Arabia. But to your point, I think it's about monetizing the assets in the ground today, because in 20 years, it's not going to be worth as much. I think it's that story, which is ironically what Saudi Arabia is also trying to do. They're trying to keep the prices at a certain level so they can get the oil out. That's there. Their spare capacity is worth more now. But don't forget the cost of production for Saudi Arabia in the United Arab Emirates is, is, like, it. is like down here. It's like literally you drive out and you go... Yeah. yeah, like you can't really that, compare that, that, it. That's a representation of Especially what the billions fiscal, of capex is about. But the fiscal break-even is quite high. Well, the fiscal break-even is a lot higher. It's eighty-five dollars. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they don't they don't care. But it's about it's about who in Europe goes to. So this is the American trade. This is the American M and A uh, landscape. What happens with Equinor? What happens with uh, the, the, the European producers? Are they going to be bounced right. into doing deals? I want to cut to the Tough chase one. here. You've got a great, you've got an earned reputation in speaking to oil executives. Thank you. Mike Worth is of the Fighting Colorado Buffaloes. Did he bring Dion to Colorado? Was he instrumental? <laughs> is this in sports? Bringing Dion He's on Sanders? The sports. I know literally nothing about sports. John Dion has Sanders father. came to University of Colorado. Did Mike Worth affect that is transaction? Football? I don't know. Oh, God. F football? Is this so what is this? Is it's this rugby? What it is? Like, it's surveillance. Is, is if it you basketball? Don't, no, Alex. It's Bloomberg <laughs> surveillance. If you don't know the answer, make up. If you don't know the question, make up an answer. Yes, and That's the answer is yes for rugby. Perfect. That was great. <laughs> England's out of the World, uh, Alex, of the World Alex, Cup. <laughs> all of this is great, but the bottom line, Alex Steele, you have the most important interview of the day. Forget about Worth and Hess. Can't wait to see what John Hess says. You get Virgin Atlantic. I get that. Okay, great. Ed Bastian on yes. the massive screw up at Delta on their damn lounges. Yes. I was in there. I couldn't even find a place to sit. What are you going to ask Ed Bastian today as he salvages his relationship? I mean, Sky Miles, man, like they messed up. Like they went too hard, too fast. So we're going to be like, what are you doing now? You what have to backtrack. So what are they you going to be doing now? Do they now? have the upper hand against United right now? Oh. I would say yes. I, I mean, they know. have different parts of their business too, right? Like they have the Amex partnership, which is really important. So uh, which so card should I get? Should I, should I get a Delta card? It's a Delta I'm Amex, Emirates man. It's all the way. So what, what do I need? Delta Amex. Delta Amex. Sky I've money. got no credit history. What? How old are you? Really, it doesn't import I know. in. What? No, it doesn't How import this in. I did not know that. No, it doesn't it follow doesn't, me around. Thank the Lord. It doesn't. <laughs> that's that's terrible. <laughs> I'm zero credit rated in this country yeah. at this juncture. I Good morning, Bank solid, of America. I have a I'm solid. Stunned. I'm looking at him with my mouth open. I have a solid 290 <laughs> credit rating. We covered this. And I'll leave this you with this week. thought. That's not a I thing. I got a credit card, but we can't say which bank because that would be. No, we don't say that. We don't say we that. We don't say that. We don't but, say that. But it's going to be timely. I mean, they're in an uproar. All of these airlines are tanking. Aren't yeah. They? What, well, what's the plan? Well, also. 
Ed Bastian and Shai Weiss are supposedly really good friends, too. So it's going to. Do you think there's a merger here? No, no. Yes. I just think they're going to talk about stuff. Apparently, they have a competition about shoes. I don't know. This is oh, a Guy Johnson on. thing. He's been talking about shoes but, all morning. Come on, so it's also about to them merge. together. Guy Johnson's Virgin, very British. Virgin very has British. to merge, right? I, I have no idea. Okay. Do they? Why? Okay. You tell me. What, no, why I would just, they have to merge? Because it makes for good theater on early morning TV. Ah, I mean, okay. You know, it's, it's, it's a day to 10 a.m. But maybe yeah. Virgin Atlantic will give something to the rugby team in yes, exactly. Texas. She is okay, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm actually out of this hand of poker. Alex Steele, I'm out. thank you so much. Greatly, I greatly appreciate it. We're going to try to get them back on the rails here, but seriously, two key interviews this morning. You'll see this in the 10 o'clock hour. Guy Johnson and a player to be named later, they'll be speaking uh, with Chevron and Hess. This is John Hess, the son of the founder of Amarada Hess, and Mike Worth, of course, of Chevron. And then later on, on the airline business, Ed Bastian, uh, really timely with Shea Weiss of Virgin Atlantic uh, as well. The airline's really struggling here with Brent Crude uh, where it is. Lisa, to get on track here, I'm still absolutely stunned by a 10-year yield 4.8. 98%, a 5% print two hours ago. And how much is that kind of forcing the issue of some of these <clears throat> mergers? Just to bring a full circle, circle, because you need that economies of scale to service your right. debt. Does the U.S. government and need economies of scale? One of the most important debt? moments in this 2023 was Jeffrey Curry of Goldman Sachs saying that new real interest rate dramatically changes oil manufacturing all of a sudden, worldwide. All of a sudden, it costs something to park your capital in an a ev physical asset. An eventful morning here for Bloomberg Television and Radio. Look for our conversation on a $60 billion transaction, Chevron and Hess. Katie Nixon from Chicago, next. The Fed speak out there for the last year, higher for longer, is truthful. It's what's happening. Central banks are going to be, on average, facing supply shocks where they're constantly needing to push down on inflation. For now, the Fed is still looking at some of these forward indicators, and that's why they're so cautious. The question going forward, just how strong is this economy? Does it warrant yields above 5%? The challenge is not necessarily where yields are because growth is still so strong. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Slowly, and then all of a sudden, a whole new world in yields. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Television. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz. John is off on vacation. Menace yeah, Cranny very please. much in, uh, which we are very pleased. A good and beautiful thing. Tom, it is a whole new world in yields when you talk about 5% on a 10-year yield, when you talk about 2.5% on the real yield that you're looking at. With all the narratives going on, it still is about what the fixed income market signals here. And it signals not only the history here of going through a 5% 10 year that takes us back to 07 before that even back to 1992 I believe but I'm gonna look at a real yield up seven basis point buttress nicely up against 2.52 uh, percent I thought Thomas the Taurus of Strategus was stunning on the impact of this yield structure to most of America, not Chevron Hess America. Exactly, that you're basically seeing the pain bleeding out in smaller businesses, but it's not really represented by companies that are seeking an economy of scale and menace. Maybe that is the linkage right now to why we're seeing an accelerating number of tie-ups in the energy pass at a, a, pass, a patch in the time where you really need to see those economies of scale. Well, it's when, not, not when, but defining when peak oil is going to be and lots of people have done that over the over the past couple of years these companies need scale they need to deliver that's why they're doing the deals the next shoe to drop alex will catch up with the ceos the next shoe to drop is what kind of deals are going to be done in europe as a result of the american <coughs> consolidation that you see but this goes to your point tom you've been talking about zombie roll up yeah. sure i could try to steal it from you but i won't uh you did talk about how this would essentially be the story of the year we haven't seen it to such a big deal, but are we starting to see it now as people right. get a little bit more desperate and get the sense that maybe yields are not going down okay. as quickly as they previously thought? The key thought. word there is desperate, not to slow the opening of the 8 o'clock uh, hour down, but I'm seeing elements of desperation there which force those kind of transactions. The Financial Times article this week on Kathy Wood, who you and I and John spoke to, was scathing of how Kathy Wood is rationalizing losses within her fund 
is a benefit to her shareholders. That's one of the silliest things I've ever seen. <laughs> and that, I'm not saying. Well, there's a lot Arc, of fund managers out there are going to have to do that. Yeah, year. but I'm not saying that Arc is a zombie roll up, but I'm saying there are all these shades and elements of this rate of change of yield move that we've seen. Well, you've been raising this a lot, the price down aspect of bonds yields going up. And at what point do you well, realize those losses? Let's go up the road from Dubai. Manus Cranny, you've lived it. Abu Dhabi and the, the, the not only their sovereign wealth fund and oil prosperity, but the stub they have in technology. Are we going to see write downs in this yield move of private equity and shadow transactions that we really don't follow on a day to day basis? Those funds, I mean, some of the biggest bond buyers in the world have traditionally come from Jeddah. There's massive banks in Saudi Arabia. There's the traditional sovereign wealth funds. Those sovereign wealth funds are perhaps less exposed to treasuries now than they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I was a young bond salesman going to Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Riyadh and Kuwait and Oman. The structure has changed and how they deploy their capital is absolutely irrevocably changed. They're not so stuck in treasuries as they were 30 years ago. They are structurally more diversified than you and I can mm -hmm. even dream of. The PIF has, a, has an office down the road. Mubadala has an office down the road. So the structure right. of holdings is different. Do they own English rugby? No, but uh, not yet, Tom. Just not wait. Yet. Wait on that. There is this issue. They lost this week. How did they, where did they go? Where, how did we get to rugby? Well, I think that uh, that was a nod to, to the randomness of the joy of the mornings. I will just say, let's take a look at markets and what's going okay. on right now, Please. because uh, those yields have come off some of the earlier highs, and with it, you do see a tempering in the sell-off a bit. S and P futures lower by a half of a percent, forty-two twenty-seven. But this comes ahead of. $15 trillion, more than $15 trillion of market cap. U.S. companies reporting earnings, including Meta and Amazon uh, and Microsoft. Euro, a little bit stronger, but really basically stasis. The 10 years, whereas right. the inf information is 40 basis points in six trading days. What we do at Surveillance here, folks, is we get out front of the information you need on these transactions. We always protect the copyright of our guests, and we protect the copyright this morning. Get from Citigroup, Scott Gruber's first look. It's Chevron Hess. Lisa, it's simple. He makes no bones about it. Guiana is the core of uh, John Hess's uh, shop. He also says Chevron Hess has, and I love this quote, might not have the zing of other transactions. He walks through some fancy ratio analysis, which is two months from Monday morning. But Gruber, a little bit tepid on this, he says Chevron needs high-grade assets doesn't quite have the zing means that the yeah. shares are lower by about 2.3% uh, in pre-market trading. Really, to understand the cross-section of higher yields and what that means for a corporate complex that's managed to adjust and adapt pretty well so far this year, Katie Nixon, Chief Investment Officer at Northern Trust Wealth Management. And earlier this morning, Katie, we were talking with Wei Lee of BlackRock, and she said for the first time, after three years of being underweight duration, they are moving to neutral. Are you feeling the same kind of feeling in your portfolio? We are feeling that kind of feeling, Lisa. And yields right now are above our target range uh, based on all of the elements that you all have covered so nicely. Fundamental, technical elements have driven yields beyond where they probably should be. So it does feel like a time to take on a little duration. It's also really a time to just reassess portfolios in general and recognize that at a 5% tenure, you can really de-risk your portfolio out of equities and into, into fixed income, believing that yields will eventually be coming down. So Katie, if you're there and BlackRock is there via Wei Lee, what goes through my mind is, how positioned is the market for this moment? A lot of people were long and wrong at 3.75. Stephen Major was with me last week. He said, look, I was wrong all the way up. It was rich at four, it's rich at five. How under positioned is the market? Do you think this is the moment when duration hunters will be heroes? I think it's quite under positioned. And Lisa, I love when you said slowly and then all at once, because probably that's how it's going to correct itself, is that investors will reposition because everyone's sort of been chasing this market in the wrong way. I think this no. has made uh, you know, uh, strategists, economists, investors very humble as we underestimated inflation, we've underestimated growth, uh, we've just been on the right. wrong side, yep. catching up. Katie, I, I look at this, and I'm gonna go back to Wellesley College a few years ago where at gunpoint you had to study with Carl Case. Indeed. And you know, he was a giant, he was beyond kind to me uh, as well. I didn't attend Wellesley College, I don't know if that's an exclusive <laughs> you don't news. Say. But, There's but something you haven't what, done. what Carl Case would say about this is this linkage of economics and all the worries our listeners and viewers have 
you need to keep it separate from investment. Northern Trust has done this for a gazillion years. How do you do that exercise now? Keep Carl Case's world separate from what do I do with my stocks? Well, I think you also you have to understand, and this is something I think uh, Professor Case would would have agreed with is um, you know the market's not the economy, and the economy's not the market. And if you look back and do the empirical research, you see very little linkage, unfortunately, to things like GDP and forward-looking equity returns. So you've got to look at the investment merits of the asset classes that you're investing in. And valuation all comes down to valuation and what's reflected in the market's right. view of those asset classes relative to what you think. So they are should you active? Or passive right now. I mean, you, you know, you're in Chicago, the land of Morningstar, and they're like <laughs> preaching, you know, index, index, index. Forget about it. White Sox, Cubs, active or passive? Well, you've got Morningstar, you've got University of Chicago, you've got a lot of folks on the passive uh, on the passive side there. And I think this has, again, I talk about being a humbling experience. This has been a very humbling experience for active managers. My goodness, the, the, the Magnificent Seven and the S&P 500 have dominated. So what have you done with the Magnificent Seven? You're at the stodgiest of stodgy trust companies. You should see their seats at Comiskey Park 40 years ago. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's a flash wound. But, 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 <laughs> but what do you do with the Magnificent Seven at a stodgy trust? company like the Northern Trust. You know what, Tom? Honestly, we believe the markets are pretty efficient. Uh, markets are efficiently valuing those those assets, and we do believe in passive a passive core uh, as part of a, a, a client's risk asset portfolio. It's very, very hard to beat the market. Even forget about this year. This has been an extreme example of, of the overweight of the Magnificent Seven. But go back any year whether it's high volatility, low volatility, concentrated, diverse, it's very, very hard to beat the market. And this is something that people are realizing as they get it wrong yet again. You said that you have started to see an opportunity to, to, uh, to rotate back into duration. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering when you started to feel that, what the trigger point was at a time where we've seen yields march so significantly higher in such a short period of time? I think it's just that, Lisa, the fact that it's happened so quickly um, against a forecast that we have had around a 450, 10 year, 425, 450, 10 year, to see it jump from 450 to five in a relatively short amount of time was a real catalyst to say, there, there's something going on here that isn't fundamental. There's some technical, some sentiment, right. something happening in the market. Then I will also say, Lisa, that prior to this, we really had been favoring credit, um, looking at credit as being a pretty good deal relative even to equities. Um, and I know you follow this really closely. We've just started now to see credit start to readjust to this new higher normal environment. Yeah. Um, so again, I think we're, it's time to sort of pivot back to duration. This is actually exactly what Wei Li was talking about, mm -hmm. that they're, they're liking investment grade credit that much less mm -hmm. as you're starting to see spreads reflect some of the increase in benchmark Okay, yields. so where do you go? Are you telling me Northern Trust has moved from a historic two, three, four percent cash out to 42 percent cash? Not at all, Tom. We are just back at our strategic allocations. We're advising clients to keep at least a year or two in cash now they're getting paid to do that. Um, we've always been telling them right. to do that, though. Now they're getting 5% to, to sit and wait. Um, and we're advising them to really re rethink their investment strategy in this new higher interest rate environment where you don't have to take equity risk if you don't need to. Mm -hmm. You can pull back on that and invest at a 5% tenure to fees 10-year goals with treasuries. We'll see. Katie Nixon, thank you so much. Thanks, the North, I, I'm sorry, I have to say the, because my grandfather said it. The <laughs> Northern Trust Company and Northern Trust Wealth Management of Balmy, Chicago. Uh, really interesting conversation there, Lisa. And, and you know, again, it's, it's something like we would say with Liz Ann Saunders at Schwab. What are people actually doing right now? What are they doing? I think is fascinating. We've seen money market flows, although that's starting to shift a little bit, and I wonder how much is going into duration. If you're <clears> buying <throat> longer term bonds, it doesn't mean it can drive yields lower if it's a price yeah. sensitive buyer. And I think that is what we're learning the difference may be. Futures negative 21, Dow futures negative 174, the VIX 22.38. On the S&P, we are down half of 1%. It feels like uh, as this war drags out on them in the Middle East, there is a feeling that the existential risk isn't hanging over markets quite as much. And Menace, I know you've been covering this quite a bit, but it feels like right now people are saying we're going to wait and see unless there's an escalation. We're going to really uh, just sort of put that in the back burner and focus on everything else. So I'm going to give you just a, a moment and a pause for thought. I grew up in Northern Ireland. I've lived through violence. I've lived through peace negotiations. I've seen many wars. I've lived through Iraq and one thing or another. The bottom line is, it is so presumptive 
and so preemptive of these markets to think that it's time to say that cessation is coming. We are far from making that call, and these markets are way yeah. too presumptive. And I would say, man, I say, we, we could go all day on this. This is a new conflict with the immediacy of video and social. Even over this weekend again, I'm like, I want to hear more about the prosecution of a military event, and I'm not getting that. I'm There's getting very a, of it. a cable TV narrative, if you will. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing a lot of people stand in front of screens and talk about what they presume. We'll have this conversation exactly. in just a moment uh, with, with a former general. But th the issue is this. Something has happened between the coalition of the West in terms of the communication with Israel in regards, right. to, the, in regards to the next steps uh, into Gaza. I can't say enough about this. Manus Cranny with us this morning. John Farrell uh, away for a well-deserved week. Uh, coming up. Uh, next, Terry Haynes will join us of Pangea Policy, and I'm thrilled to say Frank McKenzie will join us later, the former general, the 14th commander of the U.S. Central Command. Please stay with us in New York on radio and television. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson and Alex Steele sit down for an exclusive interview with Virgin Atlantic CEO Shai Weiss and Delta CEO Ed Bastian. The health of airline companies, the future of business travel, and headwinds facing the industry. Tune in today at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. London time on Bloomberg Television. Context changes everything. We expect uh, that there's a likelihood of escalation, escalation by Iranian proxies directed against our forces, directed against our personnel. Uh, we are taking steps to make sure that we can effectively defend our people and respond decisively if we need to. This is not what we want, not what we're looking for. We don't want escalation. The Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, there with NBC this weekend, an immovable story already changed from what we heard on Sunday. We say good morning on radio and television. John Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom King. Mr. Farrell, uh, south, somewhere warm. You know, it's like he's smarter than we are. Manus Cranny, we are hugely advantaged to have Mr. Cranny choose to, vo to, to visit. His people were really uncertain. And, you know, Manus, seriously, to have you in here with the Dubai I experience, what does the media frenzy look like for the United Arab Emirates? What, what, what is it? How does it synthesize over there? You know what's interesting is a couple of weeks ago we had King Abdullah here in New York at the UN meetings. We also had uh, Anwar Gagash, who's the de facto foreign minister for the United Arab Emirates, who signed on to the Abraham Accords. This is a very delicate moment uh, for the UAE and for a number of other nations that have that have very close relationships now with Israel. But you fly in, folks, and all of a sudden you're looking down at, you know, it's deserty like thing, and then you realize, I, I, I get my compass wrong, but it's a flight path into Dubai and you're flying over Iran. Yes. Like, you're like, okay, I'm over Iran. Is that good or bad? And then you turn right and you go into Dubai past a gazillion dollars of office development. That's how close UAE is to Iran. It is, and that is the whole crux of escalation risk, the proxies of Iran and how they may launch new right. assaults on Israel. There's already many skirmishes, but of course this is about escalation risk. I've said it to you before the break, these markets are very presumptive and pre I, that, that we're going to get that. Well, it goes to your point about how we don't really know what's going on and how, yeah, yes, there's a media war right now where everyone's trying to get the upper hand in the narrative, but we have no clue what the negotiations of the UAE, Zero. And Qatar, right. and Saudi Arabia, and the proxies from Iran really As, look like. Well, you heard from the Secretary of State there. We need to get another important view, probably more important than the Secretary of State. Terrence Haynes joins right now, founder of Pangea Policy. Terry, I mean, to move, and so honored to have Manus with us today with real-world experience. Do we have an Iranian policy? Uh, we've got several, Tom. Uh, we had one before a couple of weeks ago uh, that had a uh, that was uh, considered by its enemies to be an appeasement policy. But uh, uh, I think uh, Secretary Blinken and others would have called it a rapprochement. 
Uh, either one, uh, I think, has been b- b- blown up by by and large and replaced with one that we're groping towards now, which is a kind of three quarters confrontation, uh, one uh, one quarter uh, rapprochement policy. So, uh, uh, you know, so we're we're moving in real time towards a right. very different policy than we've been talking about just a couple of weeks ago. The 12th commander of CENTCOM, Mr. Austin, was on with us this morning. General McKenzie will join later the 14th commander of CENTCOM. Is CENTCOM yes. advising or telling or listening to the Israeli Defense Forces? What What's the relationship of our military on a Monday afternoon with the military of Israel? Uh, they consult very closely. Uh, they always have. I mean, they do in real time, whether there's a crisis like this or not. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think what you're seeing is from Secretary Austin and others a desire to have the Israelis, uh, you know, among other things, advised rather forcefully. They're talking in two sorts of ways. One is kind of strategic, tactical, supportive on whatever uh, whatever military operation the Israelis do. But at the same time, uh, there's a more advisory role about uh, the second, third, fourth steps, uh, you know, what may happen down the road and, you know, kind of what we're prepared to do and may not be. Terry, are we seeing the U.S. lose its leadership role when it comes to geopolitical negotiations? I think we're seeing it challenged, certainly. And, uh, so it's up to the United States to recover that. There has been a muddle. I don't. No point in me overemphasizing it. But there's been kind of a muddle in United States uh, geopolitical leadership ever since uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan a couple of years ago. Uh, it seems clear in retrospect that what uh, the, the what ended up happening was a, a, a very bad signal was sent uh, to those who wish this country ill, and uh, we're now scrambling to recover that. Terry, can the U.S. do what it says that it wants to do if we don't have a speaker in the House? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, firstly, I think we'll probably have one this week or next. But more importantly, uh, you know, what you've got is, you know, Biden says he's going to send an aid package down. Apparently, the Senate's seen part of it, but not all of it. Uh, the Senate will will will. will uh, under current schedule, we'll try to take something up uh, next week to start that process. Uh, by the time the House resolves its speakership issue, uh, I would expect the House to catch up. But the Senate is is uh, is hugely more consequential in this than the House, and I would note uh, much more bipartisan as well. Both uh, both Schumer and McConnell are, are broadly, generally, as McConnell said yesterday, on board with the idea that these are all part of one conflict. But it's going to be up to all of them to convince the rest of the Senate and much of the House. Terry, good morning. I just want to uh, carry on from Lisa's point, which is about U.S. foreign policy, exceptional lead, the dominant force in the world. Mm -hmm. To sustain that narrative, how important is it that they get the $100 billion that Biden has asked for? Is Is the size of the aid for Ukraine and Israel inextricably going to send a global message about what U.S. foreign policy strength is at the moment? That there's substantial aid, I think, sends the, uh, you know, not, I wouldn't peg it to the number itself, Manus, but uh, that there's substantial aid for both conflicts is going to send a big message. Uh, If what the Congress comes out with is one or the other, that's going to send a bad message. Uh, The real fulcrum and the real problem here is that Biden has very little to no political capital to affect the result. Uh, So what you'll end up with is a situation where Congress, and I think principally the Senate, is going to make a decision on on the amount of both aid. I do think in the end you will see something close to what Biden is asking for, but also it's going to take a couple of months to get there. And uh, for both geopolitics and for the markets, that's going to seem way too long. Given that the U.S. is now defending vicariously in Ukraine, in the Israel-Hamas war. We haven't spoken about Taiwan, and, and, and it is there. It's a very real risk. Is it a neglected conversation? I don't think it's a neglected conversation. I think the uh, uh, we're now in a lull was probably the wrong word, but we're in a less overt phase of the, uh, uh, of the People's Republic uh, uh, poking and prodding uh, Taiwan and its defenses and the United States' will- willingness uh, to defend. Uh, 
you know, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if uh, you start seeing that poking and prodding coming back up again. Uh, right now, the United States is able, by and large, to carry uh, to to spread out appropriately. Uh, but the the risk here, which is implicit in your question, is that one or more of those turns into a hot war. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do we have the you know Do we have the capability? And secondly, do we have the material and the the abil ability to replenish? And that's very much an open question. Chair Haynes, thank you so much this morning with Pangea Policy and the Movable Feast. Again, this afternoon, Joe Matthew, Anne-Marie Horton, uh, Balance of Power as we'll drive, Balance of Power, I should say, uh, will drive forward this conversation. We barely mentioned today the upset. I believe you had earlier that there's a 6.30 confab at Ben's Chili Bowl. Yeah. Where all where the presumptive speakers are going to get together you, have you up ever on been there? Street. Have you ever been have there? Have I been there? Yeah. There's photographic evidence. Yeah, is there? Did you actually Not chili the Ben's dog? Chili Bowl at Reagan. Uh, the Ben's Chili Bowl on U Street is yeah, the yeah. real deal. It is. I've it been is. there. I, it's I, I, quite good. There. I even I took say. the offspring. <laughs> so there is going to be nine candidates up for the House Takes the whole front bar there at Ben's. And it's just who's next, right? I mean, do any of them have any critical mass? It was mm -hmm. interesting. Terry just said that he thinks we're going to have a speaker sooner than later. And maybe that's because people yeah. are just sick of this. We are going to keep this conversation going, not just the sick of the uh, discussion, but also the bond yield space. Katerina Simonetti of Morgan Stanley, Matt Brill of Invesco, Keith Lerner of Truist Advisory Services, all weighing in on the open. Pharaoh's off. I'll step in. Bloomberg Surveillance on a Monday morning. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. Bramow's run. Farrow's run. All I'm left with... You got left with me, is buddy. ...is Manus Cranny, who's <laughs> giving us great, great perspective. Seriously, folks, with decades of experience. Uh, and I mean not only, like, showbiz experience, but street experience in a fractious uh, Middle East. What's your number one observation on... Everybody's just calm. Brent's only 92. All the cranny radar must be up. I want to take you back to 1994. Yeah, okay. I remember it. The bond market Sport. was rather tricky. The single biggest margin call that I ever had was with an institution, which we won't name. But it was one of those moments in the bond market where the margin calls were not met, where the self-fulfilling prophecy of liquidation took over and the narrative shifted. And we have not, in my humble opinion, seen it. We have not seen I that agree. yet. Totally so that's just well my said. personal observation. Yeah. Stephen Major right. is greater minds than you and I, and he talked about capitulation. Right. I think capitulation today is something to what I experienced 30 years ago. I'll leave it there. I'm going to leave it as the Whalen silence. I can't say enough. I've been bringing this up to like, who's Whalen? And it's like Chris Whalen, who's lived this like man is cranny, and there's a point where your call's not taken in the bond market. Today, the history of a 10 year yield, 5%. Right now, we're enjoying 4.98% there. Kathleen Bus Johnson's going to join us here on our 5% GDP. But right now, and this is really an honor to have in the studio, Brooke Sutherland, she, you know, she's with Bloomberg Opinion. The day starts at 10 a.m. We're thrilled that she could join us today. <laughs> and this is something that I'm guilty of. I don't talk enough about industrial America. And you are writing manufacturing is cracking. I thought manufacturing was our renaissance. So that was the narrative that was out there. And I think what we're seeing is that it's much more nebulous and nuanced than maybe the uh, perception was heading into this year. Um, we've had some early reports out from industrials, particularly in Europe, um, and there are signs that you know, demand is maybe not quite booming to the extent that it was. And a lot of these companies are talking about inventory destocking, mm -hmm. that their customers went out and over ordered uh, to try to get ahead of some of these supply chain disruptions. Now they have enough inventory and are drawing that down. But I think you have to wonder at what point does an inventory destocking uh, stretch start to look like something more troubling on underlying demand if we start to see this happening for a couple quarters now? Who's going to tell you whether that's a, a, a billowing yellow flag or a full up red flag. I think you really have to watch the shorter cycle industrial companies. We're going to get a lot of them this week. We get pretty much every manufacturing giant under the sun reporting. Um, those who are in longer so which is cycle most businesses, important for you? 
I mean, all of them. I, oh, I take stop. all of my companies <laughs> are, are very you can't dear, have dear to my heart. On this show. Before uh, 10 a.m., <laughs> before 10 a.m., you have to pick a damn company. Okay, <laughs> pick. Sure. I think that GE is going to be really interesting to watch from go. the optimistic side of things. Um, they have really good exposure to the aerospace aftermarket, which I think we should see <clears throat> really strong growth in that, just given everything that's happening with Boeing's challenges, with Spirit Aerosystems. You also have Raytheon. There are problems with the GTF. All of that is very good news for the aerospace aftermarket, which has started to look a little bit long in the tooth. Then if you want to pivot to a company like 3M, that's more of a shorter cycle industrial, where I think you might start to see some of those other trends I was talking about around inventory <clears throat> destocking. Uh, come to play. What about, I, I mean, we talk a lot about it in the ether, about uh, onshoring, French shoring. We've heard it from various uh, US, US politicians when they go abroad, when I've met them in Singapore, when I've met them uh, in China a couple of years ago. But where are we on that narrative, uh, bringing business, jobs, infrastructure spending back here to the United States, or indeed to Japan, Tom, to Japan, away from China? So I think there's an issue where there's not really a consensus on what reshoring means. So we are seeing a lot of spending well, in the There's a political US. narrative around it, and then, there's then, and then there's the industrial narrative around it, isn't exactly, there? Exactly. And right. they're very different. Exactly. And so we've seen a ton of announcements, things like hospitals, pipelines. Those are not moving from China. Right. We're not relocating those. We are seeing a number of factory announcements, but a lot of those are concentrated mm -hmm. in the electric vehicle space. We had a couple of announcements last week from Tesla, GM, Ford, right. all pushing out, delaying investments in some of these factories. And that's what I'm talking about, okay. where there's sort of cracks in the narrative that these might lift all boats, this manufacturing boat, well, that's where I want but to they go. might not lift okay. them all at the same time. And folks, the, just line. so you understand, the full Sutherland nerddom is she actually gets the financials as well. Revenue, price in unit amidst a nominal GDP that surprised, like Honeywell or even dreaded 3M with their underperformance. Are we misjudging the revenue pop that manufacturing in America can do? Sure. So not all of the companies have actually put numbers around what this sort of stimulus reshoring boom might look like, but some have. Envent Electric is one of them that has talked about what the two big stimulus packages in the U.S. might mean for revenue. They're looking at maybe $350 million extra of revenue. That works out to maybe a 2.5% annual boost. You tell me, is that a boom? Well, yeah, but within the new GDP that we've all missed, is the 4% revenue growth still the 6% revenue growth because of the pop in the economy? That's the heart of the matter. So I think for some of the industrial right. companies, you're not going to see a lot of volume growth this quarter. I don't think okay. anybody's planning on that. It's a lot of price I, still, but we're seeing some deflation. I, well. I got one more question. The Gulf Stream, the surveillance Gulf Stream's getting a little long in the tooth. Now, I see the Bombardier's out with something new. Did Jonathan get that? This did is, he go on his holiday? Of course he did. I mean, Francine had it out of Marrakesh and John had it. But, like, if you're looking at private jets now out of Kansas. I mean, this is the fabric and soul of the Kansas girl. Which private jet has the upper hand right now? It's actually very surprising because you look at private jets as being a boom to bust type of market. Yeah. And this is one where I really think we might see some stability. And this is heading for, you know, I hate to use this word, but a soft landing here right. where we're really seeing a lot of discipline on the part of the manufacturers. Um, and that's really kind of keeping okay. a lid on some of the buoyancy in demand that we saw during the But I'm pandemic. asking for a friend. Which one is your favorite right now that has headroom? I don't think I have enough personal experience really on private this, jets right? to be able to, to, to give you a recommendation <laughs> here. But I can chest. connect you with some CEOs who would love to, to pitch you on her. Read Brooke Sutherland, folks, at Bloomberg <laughs> Opinion. I'm not kidding. She's absolutely definitive on industrial America and her Kansas and all that came out of Cessna uh, years ago. We're going to migrate from the industrial landscape over to the American GDP with a two-hour conversation. Kathleen Bustiansic joins us now, uh, Chief Economist, Nationwide Mutual Insurance. Kathy, once again, you have failed and everybody else with a bang-up third-quarter GDP modeled out at 5%. You're going to tell me we can't sustain that. All my radar's up. Why can't we sustain above average real GDP? Uh, good morning, Tom. Well, th th it is unsustainable. Uh, and, and the main reason is that um, we, we just don't have enough workers, really. If, if you break down GDP growth, right, it, you, you look at the number of workers and how productive. Unless we're getting a real boom in productivity growth, really hard to sustain 5% growth. And what it also does in the meantime, as you know, is overheats the economy and makes it more difficult for the Federal Reserve to, to lower inflation. And that's their, their primary goal. So I, I think one way or the other, Fed will lower inflation and continue to lower it. Uh, but that may, you know, that means that 5% is not very sustainable. Where are you on the, good morning, good to see you. Uh, where are you on the outlook for wages? Is the heat, I, I, and I suppose the fury 
of wage negotiation. Is that in the rear view mirror as you look into 2024? Yeah, good, good question, Amanis. So we're keeping an eye on, on wage growth, but what we have seen despite the numerous strikes um, that have popped up and, and concerns there, we've actually seen wage growth um, decelerate. Um, it's come down from six, seven percent. It's still running too high mm -hmm. uh, for the Fed's comfort, right? It's running around four percent or so, a little bit above that. Um, they'd really like to see that between three and three and a half to be consistent with two percent inflation. Um, but, you know, going back to the labor market is the key right now in terms of, of wage growth, but also how long this, you know, strong growth continues. It's not ultimately sustainable, but do we see some meaningful slowdown in the fourth quarter? That, that's really what's important. Tom chastened me a little bit earlier on. I, there's a great phrase that I use, if it's grand. It depends how I say the word grand. Grand can mean many different things. Mm -hmm. I said the U.S. consumer is grand. And Tom rightly chastened me. He said, did you look at the delinquencies on subprime in the, in the auto industry? Did you look at, at perhaps the underbelly uh, of, of what is going on? We're going to get retail sales. You know, it, it, they remain grand in inverted commas. But suddenly we're dealing with a shift in rates to above 5%. Would you describe the consumer as grand? Or how challenged does the consumer become in a world of where rates actually tightening, tightening, tightening? Yeah, I, I think the the, consu the way I would say it is the consumer looks to be grand, but there are a lot of headwinds um, hitting the consumer. Mm -hmm. Now, the tailwind has been the labor market, very strong, right? As long as the labor market is churning out the amount of jobs, you know, 200,000, yeah. 300,000, right, the consumer is going to keep spending. But you have the still elevated inflation. You have uh, consumer loan payments, you know, kicking in. And as you said, certain demographics are really challenged right now yeah. um, and, and delinquency is picking up a little bit. So it's not a completely rosy picture here, but I would just say you got to follow the labor market. That That is the key. So uh, if I'm the Fed, I'm going to follow the labor market. I'm data dependent, but I, I would suggest November 1-ish is upon us. And, you know, we're, we're going to sort of have a post-Halloween party. I guess it's a non-meeting. December... For Kathy Buschansik, how key is the December meeting? Oh, it, it, it's important. Um, you know, I, I think each meeting is important in the sense, not what they do, but it's, it's what Chairman Powell guides us, right? What, what do we hear in the press conference? But December, we'll get the revised uh, forecast, right? We'll get the macro forecast and, and the dot plot estimate. Um, even though those aren't, you know, golden rule, right? It doesn't Thank mean God that's that. exactly what the Fed's going to do, right? But, but yeah. it's guidance. Um, and, um, you know, be, it'd be interesting to see. Our view is growth slows by more than half, right, in the fourth quarter. We see it running a bit above 2%. But I have to say that handoff, you know, men have talked about retail sales. The handoff consumer spending to the fourth quarter was a bit firmer than we thought. Um, we really need to see consumer, we need to see growth for the Fed to feel comfortable below 2%. I mean, Chairman Powell told us he thinks yeah. growth potential growth is 2%, right? So yeah. he wants that on a sustained basis. I mean, Kathy, you're with Nationwide. Do you have tickets to Michigan right around Thanksgiving? I mean, it's at Michigan. I get that. But you're Kathy Bus Johnson. Can you get us into 100,000 people at Ann Arbor? Only if you're, if you're voting for um, Ohio State. It can only do that. Very good. We're from Columbus and Nationwide. Kathleen Bustjansic, you should see the seats they got her. For, you, you know, this is foreign, right? Yeah, I don't do corporate. 100,000 seats. I don't, this is college. This whole football, American football thing is, is alien to me. I, I went to Columbus. I had the honor of giving a speech there. And, you know, you go down the street and it's, it's, line, it's like iron. It's lined with bars the whole way down the street. What are you and saying you about Ireland? you get to the football stadium. And you get to the football <laughs> stadium. And it's for Kathy Bus Johnson and all. It's like religion. If I she mean, gets you a ticket, can I come? We get two tickets. We can, we can say, go on the lair. So far, you are so far away. If you look over the edge of the stadium, you can see East Lansing uh, in uh, the difference. I mean, I thought this was really, really really uh, interesting from Kathy. Well, I want to talk about this here in a moment, Manis, because I, you know, I think this underestimation of economic growth, we'll talk about the UK on this as well. Futures improved negative 12. The VIX at 22.05 as well. On those standard and poor's futures, 42.36, we're down three tenths of a percent. We say good morning to all of you on Bloomberg Surveillance. Manis Cranny in for John Farrell. Lisa Bramwitz in deep preparation for the nine o'clock uh, meeting. Manis, I, I just got a, a oh. pick on you here. Go on. And I saw Governor Bailey uh, at Marrakesh, shook his hand. We, he ran for me as fast as he could. 
You know that they underestimated GDP in the United Kingdom a number of weeks ago. We underestimated GDP in America now. I mean, that's a, th that's a trend here off pandemic. I think they've been off kilter in a lot of their estimates. It's interesting. When you talk to people at, uh, in, in the UK that run businesses there and they talk about you're still spending inside the UK. You have less labor coming in from outside. People's wages have risen inside the UK and people continue to spend inside the UK. And that is giving sustenance, bigger sustenance to the economy perhaps than they had uh, had assumed. I mean, what, what's the last line? Governor signals UK inflation fight has further to run. You could be very shocked what the Bank of England does in terms of rates relative to the Fed. Well, and, and the gilts market shows that they've got a bigger challenge. I mean, it, it's a one-seventh the size of the economy. I don't mean to compare them, but the answer is uh, it, it's a very different story over there, and there's a little, seems to be a little more stress in the system than over here. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the retail sales, the inflation numbers, they are, they are showing points of stress. What you don't want to happen, here, here's a thought for you. Last year, the gilt market convulsed, absolutely convulsed. Yeah. The risk is this, not that the U.S. Treasury market would convulse in the same way, but there are so many prongs of attack on the U.S. Treasury market at the moment, something's right. going to pop. Including uh, the bid from China. Wei Li with us yeah. from BlackRock earlier this morning. Look for that on Bloomberg Digital. Coming up, without question, our conversation of the day on the military affairs of the Eastern Mediterranean. General McKenzie joins. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. There's been kind of a muddle in the United States uh, geopolitical leadership ever since uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan a couple of years ago. Uh, it seems clear in retrospect that what uh, the, the, what ended up happening was a, a, a very bad signal was sent uh, to those who wish this country ill, and uh, we're now scrambling to recover that. Terry Haynes piercing with Pangea policy there and the politics of this moment. Terry Haynes. Uh, in uh, Washington as well. Manis Cranny and Tom Keen uh, this morning. John Farrow on assignment. Lisa Abramowitz getting ready for an important 9 o'clock hour. In the 10 o'clock hour, two key CEO sets of interviews. We will look at uh, Mike Wirth of, uh, of Chevron along with John Hess of Hess. And then we'll look also at Delta and Virgin Air. Alex Steele driving those conversations uh, this morning. This is a great honor. And just to give you a window into like the five lives of Tom Keene, long ago and far away, not NROTC, but Army ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corp. I was a winner of the Daughters of the American Revolution Award. This is ancient history. It's just after the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a kind of thing you do in college if you don't go to the military academy. Someone who enjoyed this experience but had a sterling career serving the nation was Frank McKenzie. To say he's executive director of Global and National Security Institute and, yes, a former Central Command commander. He joins us this morning at the Citadel. And I speak here, uh, General, of Natalie Stewart, the Marine Corps winner this year at the Citadel of that August award. What was it like coming out of NROTC, your first day serving the nation? Well, I was excited. I, uh, I had the good fortune to actually go to Okinawa uh, to command a rifle platoon in the 3rd Marine Division in, uh, in 1980. It was an exciting time. We deployed to Korea. We did a variety of things that were all very challenging for somebody just just out of college. It was a, uh, it was a great, bracing, exciting experience. And Apparently, I like it because I hung around for 42 years. You are the 14th commander of Central Command. The 12th uh, commander of Central Command is a bit distracted now. What is Lloyd Austin and our people in harm's way, what are they doing this morning in the Eastern Mediterranean? I think our primary task in the Eastern Mediterranean, and indeed throughout the entire region to the east, is to ensure that Iran is deterred and does not enter the, the, the current problems that Israel's having with Gaza. I think that's our overarching, uh, the overarching objective of both our diplomacy and the recent military deployments that you've seen. At the same time, we also seek to ensure uh, that Lebanese Hezbollah, sitting up in southern Lebanon, doesn't choose to enter the fray. Uh, that would be very, very bad for both those, both those entities mm -hmm. and the force that we 
move there is all designed to make them think twice before taking that taking that very bad decision. Is Israeli military or allied military impinged by the volume of modern media? This is different from your tours of duty. This video, this cable TV, this social media, does that affect the military? I think as a commander, and certainly I saw this at U.S. Central Command from 1999 to 19 to 20, from 2019 to 2022, you have to recognize that that volume of media presence is there. It's not going to go away. You can't ignore it. People are actually getting news from it, what you want to try to do. And here's where we are sometimes hampered. We're going to have an essential relationship with the truth. We want to tell the truth. When we put something out there, we want to be honest about it. We want it to be able to stand up to fact-checking, and if we make mistakes, and we do, we acknowledge those mistakes. But many of our opponents, uh, Hamas, Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, the Russians, have no essential relationship with the truth. And so that's not important to them when they operate in the media and in the information space. General, very good morning to you. You talk about uh, how collaterals are being deployed. There was a statement yesterday from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III, obviously deploying an additional uh, carrier, the USS Dwight Eisenhower, uh, to Central Command and also readying some troops uh, just on the, on, on the risk of needing them. How important is this step change in preparedness for an escalation? Because that does not sound like a nation, the USA, in preparedness for de-escalation. Well, actually, it is all designed for escalation. Uh, the capabilities that we're bringing into the theater are largely uh, in, involved circle around air and missile defense and the ability to fight in that domain. So that's the threat. The threat to Israel is actually not large-scale invasion from Iran or Lebanese Hezbollah. It actually is the, the proliferation of missiles, land attack cruise missiles, which are low-flying missiles, and of course, drones. And so the systems that we're bringing into the theater are all designed to assist in the defense of Israel against those weapons. But also, uh, should, should it be necessary, we, have the, we always reserve the right to strike from where those missiles came. Do you think that that buildup is enough in messaging of itself to Iran to perhaps reduce the risk of multiple fronts escalating? You talked about Hezbollah in Lebanon, et cetera, but do you think that this military show is a message, a communication to Iran about the folly of escalation on multiple fronts? We know analytically that Iran looks very carefully at the correlation of forces in the region. When we reinforce, uh, they, they take notice of that. In fact, going back over many years, we can trace very clearly Iran provocations to unwise, untimely uh, drawdowns in our posture in the region. So I think this will have an effect. Now, look, it's always hard to predict mm -hmm. ultimate decisions mm -hmm. in Iran. There variables. But I think I think we're doing all the right things. I think the messaging from the secretary has been very strong, very clear. I think the forced posture in the theater sends a very clear signal to Iran. In the theater, General McKenzie, there will be the question of should we show the flag and should we have a different deployment of our forces over a long period? Do you see a sea change here where we will deploy differently in the Mediterranean up to Turkey, that we'll, we'll deploy differently in the Red Sea and on down to the Indian Ocean. Is it a sea change moment for the Pentagon? I think what we're, uh, we're relearning an old lesson that uh, while you may want to turn your back on the Middle East and you may want to walk away, and we do in, in many ways, uh, you can't actually do that because we have vital national interests here. We have longstanding friends here, and we're going to have to keep a presence here. Again, I think we, we trace many of these problems to times when we've let our posture drop too low in the, in the theater, in the region. Our friends uh, are not reassured by that, and our potential adversaries draw confidence confidence when we do that. So uh, is it a sea change? Don't know. Too soon to tell. Mm -hmm. I will say this. I think that we're seeing right now are appropriate, timely, measured, and, uh, and I believe they're going to have an effect. General McKenzie, thank you so much. Frank McKenzie of the Citadel and the Central Command uh, with us uh, today. I, I'm absolutely fascinated, uh, Manus, of what you say of this, of a, a larger deployment of America across the sphere you know so well out of 
uh, Dubai. I, I can't frame it right now, but but there already is such a question. significant. There is already a hugely significant American strategic relationships with a number of these countries. The UAE, the one that I lived in for the past five, six years, we were on the verge of something much more significant about American foreign policy as a proper agreement with Saudi Arabia to let them. Uh, have a proper security guarantee. There's a right. huge, there's a huge right. base in Bahrain, Tom. There's huge military, U.S. military presence right the way across the Gulf. I, I didn't get to this uh, because of time, but Manus, let me have you help us uh, with it. The general mentioned the Russian sphere, which to me goes down to Syria and the shore of the Mediterranean. From where you were in in, in Dubai, do the Russians can they easily expand off of this uh, uh, set of events in the Eastern Mediterranean? I think that. I think anybody who is at loggerheads with the United States vicariously through Ukraine, they're going to seek to take any opportunity then they yeah. can to capitalize on that. I mean, I'm not a war strategist, but one can only assume that the United States is now battling uh, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, a disarray in, 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 in Washington. This is a moment of where those who want to do harm right. will seek to take opportunity. And, and, and if Russia can capitalize on, on that, they, yeah. I would assume they would. The general alluded to that, to say uh, the least. Again, I must admit, uh, mention as well, Manus Cranny, uh, look for him in the 5 a.m. hour. I get up uh, earlier Danny, than you, Tom. Or, well, you know, 20 minutes earlier. Danny he slides in at 452, folks. <laughs> With Danny Berger, it's a transatlantic wake up for the United States, uh, a brief, if you will, early uh, in uh, the morning. Futures improve. We're negative 20 something now, negative 18. The VIX comes in a little bit from 22 almost to 23, 22.15. Right now, I'm going to call it a churning market looking for a place to go. The 10 year real yield, 2.51%. Uh, this morning, in the 11 o'clock hour on the airline business, the gentleman from Virgin Atlantic, Shea Weiss, and also Delta's chief executive officer, Ed Bastian, on the turmoil in airlines. Look at those stocks. They're all traveling south. On radio and television, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.